You might not know his face, but you certainly know his records. With over 500 top 40 hits to his name, that's three times more than anyone else we could find in the history of recorded music, Phil Harding's career started at the age of 16, with over a decade at London's famous Marquee Studios, and then soared to incredible heights in the 1980s as chief engineer at PWL Studios with the legendary songwriting and production team Stock, Aitken and Waterman, selling over 150 million records and scoring over 100 top 40 hits in the UK alone. In the 90s, Phil's career continued to flourish at his own P&E Music, which operated from London Strongroom Studios with fellow PWL confederate Ian Kerno, producing further hits for the likes of Take That, E17, Cliff Richard, Curiosity, Juice, 911 and OTT. In this century, he became Dr. Phil Harding, authored two books, became co-vice chairman of James, and we talked to him about all of that in this interview, as well as what went wrong the week Kylie came in. So clearly that week that Kylie was there, she, she, she never made it onto the board. Because <laughs> Pete hadn't, hadn't told the boys. And how he first met Pete Waterman. We were sitting there one day having a meeting with Richard and in burst this character <laughs> with a red leather jacket, matching red leather trousers. Oh, wow. And his thoughts on Dolby Atmos. It's got endless possibilities. And don't forget to check out Phil's two excellent books. The link to his website is in the description. I bought a record as a 10 to 13 year old back in 1985 and it was Spin Me Round oh, by yeah. Dead or Alive. And before that I'd been listening to sort of punk and what my dad was playing me, lots of Booker T and the MGs and yeah, Motown yeah. and things like that. And, yeah. and, and I remember I heard it on the radio and the vocal attracted me. It was yeah. such a powerful vocal. Threw you in, yeah, yeah. And so I bought the record and I got it home and I put it on and I remember distinctly thinking this is a band but it ain't no band. There's the drummer's not drumming. Yeah. The bass player's not basing. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I flipped it over and it said mixed and engineered by Phil Harding. And mm. that, I thought, I want to do that. <laughs> that's what I want to do. Right. It literally, that's a really defining moment in, oh, in right. my history. Um, that's great to hear that. I've inspired yourself and, and hopefully others along the way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was your name yeah. rather than Pete Waterman's or, or, yeah. or the, ba you know, the bands. Right. I, I kind of had a feeling that the band really weren't doing anything. Yeah. Um, but it was the fact that it was it was engineered. It was yeah. you know, someone had. It wasn't just produced. It wasn't just played. Yeah. It was actually almost yeah. manufactured. Yeah. And there was so much energy in it, and obviously a fantastic record that sold yeah. millions yeah. all over the world. Yeah. Um, but that was my kind of defining moment. That was the moment when I thought I want to be an audio engineer. So how did how did you get into it back in the seventies? Was there a similar moment for? For you? Oh, gosh, blimey. I suppose, yeah, in a way there was. Uh, I was uh, unaware of definitely what I wanted to do as a 16-year-old, but I'd been playing in bands and was into music. And I, I went to school in Dagenham, but was brought up in Romford, basically. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like many youngsters, I must have been 15 or 16, probably 16 by this time, but I did leave school at 16. Uh, but I got a summer job right. in the local music shop. Oh, great. But I can't remember the name of it, but, I, but quite typically the local music instrument shop was also an electronics shop. Right, yeah. So as well as the instruments and the bits and pieces, you had to learn about fridges and... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, it was nonsense really. But I had a moment where there was something on the radio and and because uh, obviously we had music blaring all the time you yeah. know in the music shop and it was um oh god the guy the guy <laughs> with the flute oh jethro Pro yeah jethro, um, Tull. jethro Tull. yeah jethro Tull. and whether the dj said something or whether there was an interview about the studio process some at that point someone said something about and, and that made me think oh that'd be good wouldn't it if yeah. i if i could get into the recording process of things like that um then then that would really kind of suit me so i went back to the um careers officer at the school and said i want to work in the music industry preferably in a in a, in a studio right and i just got this completely blank look you know <laughs> yeah, but what <laughs> yeah. can't do that well we're in dagenham you know i don't think there's any recording studios in dagenham i <laughs> yeah, said well yeah. you know can't you get me some interviews in london or something you know yeah and uh, you know, all, all praise to them. No, no, no idea of the name. They sent me to a couple of interviews, 
And this, so this was 1973. Right. First interview they sent me to was a video studio, believe it or not. Wow, in, in 73. Blimey. You know, um, wow. That, you know, I wasn't really into the visuals and so on, so yeah. that, 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 that drew to nothing. But then they sent me to a, um, a cable and connector manufacturer in Wardour Street right. in Soho. And, you know, quite, quite a good interview, but the guy basically turned around and said, I, I, I don't, you know, you're obviously into music, Phil. I don't think you're technical enough for what we're looking for. But the studio round the back of us, he's actually looking for a new studio assistant. Fantastic. Ha handed me the, the, the phone number of the manager, phoned the manager, uh, Jerry Collins, as soon as I got home. He said, well, we've interviewed 20 people, but if you can get here tomorrow, you know, you, you'll be the final interview. Yeah. Um, I mean, how, how your life can change yeah. in 24 hours, especially if you, you know, you follow it up and, you, and you're following your gut feelings. And I often yeah. talk about this with, with, with students. And that was at the Marquee. And that was the Marquee. Yeah. Uh, Which was on Oxford Street, I think. Uh, I remember, I remember it, the club. It like was, the club was on Water Street. Yeah, The right. studio yeah. was at the back of it. Right. So it was off Dean Street yeah. in a little kind of uh, 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 cul-de-sac called Richmond Buildings. Right. And uh, got the job. Out of, you know, Fantastic. obviously they could see my enthusiasm and uh, uh, whatever. And that was it, yeah. As you know, 16. Yeah. Uh, 1973. And I spent, and again, I'm going to spurt out what I often say to students, you know, it wasn't really until a good four to five years that, that I was fully let loose on, on, on major clients. Right. So it was, like a, it was like a four or five year unofficial apprenticeship. Yeah. No specific way to train an assistant, just make the tea, do the running, set up the mics. Yeah, by the time. You know, learn, <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. learn the process. Yeah. And, um, you know, if, if it, it, it's still relatable to today, I think, if you're a 16 year old, I, I, I would say, well, if you're determined you want to get into music or a particular type of media, no disrespect to your school, but they're probably not as well equipped as your local FE college, yeah. certainly in music. Um, and then go on and do a three-year undergraduate course. If, if that existed in my day, I, I, I would have done it. But, right. it. but it didn't exist until uh, until the Time Master course came along. Yeah, somewhere around that time or just after, you know. Yeah. So um, so that was it. That was, and it was a very very quick journey. You know, that sort of that summer left school, had the summer job, got you know got 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 the interview, got the job, and um, you know. Obviously, there's a lot of things that, that, that stick out in those early days, and obviously, I was, you know, I was young and nervous. But there were three other assistants and a, and a head assistant. Yeah. There was only one main studio. But the interesting thing was that, uh, you know, imagine if 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 that was the, like your studio next door, and you got there was a large studio area. You know, you could get a full band line up with an orchestra in there. It was not massive, but large enough. Um, but we were in the back room. Right. A bit like sort of beat. We didn't have white. Coats on, but a bit, <laughs> like, a bit, bit like BBC <laughs> technicians, where we had our own speakers and all the tape machines were oh, in a great. separate room, not not in yeah, the control so you had room. Yeah, like a machine see. room with the, all the noisy stuff. So you had an intercom, you know, the engineer, you know, come and sort this mic out, or someone wants a cup of tea, or right. you know, l load that tape. They had remotes in in the control room for the tape machines, but but you were loading them and yeah, uh, and all the rest of it. So so it was a great uh, a, a great time to sort of come into the industry at that point and learn. Mm. in that way yeah well i mean that was a you very know. exciting time as well yeah. sort of late 70s technology starting to change and i would imagine you were working with a lot of so you were working with bands like the clash and um Th that was once joke and, and that that was once i started engineering yeah right so yeah later on you know so you're so making up instruments and, and yeah but you, yeah. you're getting that good grounding of this is how i mic up a drum no kit. absolutely um, i mean just just to finish off as as an assistant i remember the first session i did where i was an assistant on my own was barry blue Right. Dancing on a Saturday night. You got to, you're probably not old enough for that one. <laughs> not quite, no. <laughs> um, but the great thing was that, as, so we did lots of pop sessions, you know, and, and you learnt this. Jeff Calver was the best pop engineer as far as I was concerned, where it was three hour chunks. Right. You know, MU rules. Yeah. So in the morning, you'd lay down three backing tracks. Lunch, in the afternoon, you'd be on to overdubs of vocals. And if you're still going in the evening, that's, that's probably vocals and mixing or whatever. But the other main client, while I was assisting, was the producer Gus Dudgeon. Oh, right. Who yeah. produced Elton John. Yeah. And we were at that point in those kind of mid-70s 
where people like Helton John and the Rolling Stones, because of tax reasons, were recording out of the country. Right. But people like us would then bring the tapes back from America or France uh, and mix them in a London studio. Right. And we had a fantastic engineer called Phil Dunn that, 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 that Gus got on really well with. And yeah. Yeah, went through mixing Captain Fantastic, The Dirt Brown Cowboy, yeah. Don't Go Breaking My Heart, Philadelphia Freedom. Yeah. Uh, and then Gus got to like the studio more and more uh, and started recording there with uh, Kiki D, I've Got The Music In Me, mm. uh, you know, lots of things like that. So, so I had this kind of grounding in the work fast pop world, yeah. M MU rules, and then, you know, uh, Gus's sessions, we, you, you'd start 11 on midday, you you'd go right through beyond midnight, you know, yeah. and then all kind of <laughs> he was crawl, quite, crawl back in the next one. He was quite a character as well, wasn't he? Quite he, a sort he of was flamboyant. Sort yeah, of, sort very flamboyant. Flam but just, you know, he was, uh, and I often say to be he was my main mentor as a producer in terms of he was, and obviously when budgets were higher back then, uh, he would spend any amount of time to get something right to his ears, even though by his own admission he was, he was no musician. Right. But... He had such a high level because, because you know, by that point, all the hits with with Elton, it was like everybody had, to, you know, he'd bring everybody up to that level. Yeah. Musicians, yeah. people around him, everything, uh, and that was, I mean, in some in some ways, I got into trouble by <laughs> thinking, well, you know, yeah, if I'm going to sort of record some things and produce. I've got to be totally in control, like us. <laughs> but as a youngster, obviously, people you you haven't got the, you know, you haven't got the experience or or, or the agency yeah. to control sessions like that. Yeah. So I so I got into trouble a few times. <laughs> it's going to yeah. be my way, or you know. Yeah, that's not your. Uh, so so you know you kind of learn to kind of get that out of you, and 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 as you know from the books, especially the the second one, you know, I, I truly believe now that we we are a service industry, mm. and 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 that. Uh, well, I'm sure we talk about a lot of it. That 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 whole thing where you know just one person is in control, especially in a studio. It's not really in my in my view. It's not really existed since those those those, those days, days in the seventies yeah. that I'm describing now. Yeah. Uh, because everything's become so much more of a group collaboration, teamwork. Yeah. And 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 everybody working to to servicing the client basically. Yeah, it's become a, a much more oiled kind of process. And I suppose yeah. when you think of it, really, recorded music hasn't still hasn't been around that long. It's only been you know, barely 100 years that we've had recorded music, yeah, which I still, right. I, sometimes I lay awake at night thinking, yeah. you know, if I'd have been born 100 years previously, yeah. the only way I'd be able to hear music would be if I could play the sheet music on my harpsichord yeah. <laughs> or if the band were in front of me. It's, and that it's, just it's, seems it's incomprehensible. But. You know, and, and, and that does cause a problem in the world of academia, as I've discovered, that, that the, it, it, it is a new subject. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it's a new research. And, and it's quite a battle uh, for those that are in the subject in academia to get it across seriously to the more traditional academics. Yeah in terms of you know th th this is a valid area of study and and i think one of the most appropriate areas certainly for a lot of us that have been industry practitioners and gone into academia like, like i have um practice-based mm. research is the most valuable yeah and i think people are becoming a little more aware of that now because you can't just be someone that's studied and studied and studied and teach but haven't actually done it, Not you done know. It. It's yeah. a vocational yeah. area. It's it is a it's, it's a practice based industry, that, and that's you hugely know. important. And that's um, and I mean, you, James, sitting in the corner here, you didn't mm. go to university to study music because I kind of grabbed you and put you in the studio and said, right, there yeah. you go. That's where you're going to learn your <laughs> your stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to have people like you teaching the subject that have been, you know, yeah. on, literally on the factory floor and have, have done yeah. it for 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 decades and. Yeah. had all that experience with all those artists yeah. like you say not just someone that studied it um, no. and and has the the relevant no that, that's not to put down the study you know but i'm yeah. saying that the study ideally needs to be at least a good percentage practice based yeah you know it really does yeah. just just learning theory is not it's not no you know and that can't cover that and you obviously know a lot about the psychology of it because you've worked with so many artists you know how yeah. to deal with a stroppy vocalist and yeah um, and that's a huge part of that, it. That as, can't really be well. taught, you know, no, that just to... has to be learned through experience and doing the job. Exactly, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, and, and James is very lucky, he had a, a, rare, um, a rare example of someone that's not gone, gone through the whole mm. kind of study area to, to, to come into a job. But yeah. it's great to see that, you know, that does still exist 
you yeah. know, and, yeah. and often with someone like yourself with a local studio that, you know, probably needs some help. It, yeah. Dare it, I suggest. I did. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was, it was, it was perfect timing as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I was, I, yeah, I was knackered yeah. and needed the help and <laughs> along he came. <laughs> you know, I, 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 it's such a common question that gets asked, you know, when, you know, if, 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 if I'm doing a guest lecture for students or maybe at a conference or something, uh, uh, and obviously, you know, the young students sort of want to know, well, how do I get a job? How do yeah. I get into the industry? Yeah. And, I've, you know, there, there's a few stock answers that one can give in terms of, you know, doing the study, uh, you know, looking at the Music Week yearly guide. It gives you a list of producers and um, studios and all the rest of it. Uh, but the most likely thing is that, well, two, two, two areas I talk about. If you if you study for a few months the Music Week charts, right. where they do give the credit of, who, of who's produced it, yeah. you keep seeing a name come up. That team or that person are probably based somewhere, and they're probably based in a private studio, yeah. probably on an industrial street, yeah. just just like we are now. <laughs> yeah, in a small um, town somewhere. So you're not yeah. you're not you're not going to find them in an average directory. You've got to do a bit of research, yeah. uh, and then track those people down, see if they've got any assistance, see if they've got the opportunity for you to go in and, you know, do some work experience, help them out for a while. And then while you're in there, make sure that you make yourself invaluable yeah. so that you, so that once you leave, hopefully the people are thinking, oh, that was really useful having someone to, you know, to do this and help with that and back up that and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, which is exactly what you did. <laughs> yeah, you made you yourself indispensable. I couldn't operate this business without you. No way. Yeah. Um, and and I don't think, and that comes from passion, doesn't it? You wouldn't give up, you wouldn't go away, you wouldn't, you know, yeah. if I said there's nothing to do, you'd still come in. I just, um, I wanted to be in a studio. Yeah. That, yeah. that was it. Yeah. I yeah. just wanted to Period. be in a studio. Yeah. I didn't care what I did, I just wanted to be in there. Yeah, and I think, I, I don't, maybe I'm just getting old, but maybe you don't see so much of that passion and driving people these these days. But like you say, you've got to, you've got to see the name. Like I saw Phil Hard every record I was listening to, Phil Harding, Phil Harding, Phil Harding, Phil Harding, Phil Harding. and yeah. uh, it's taken me, <laughs> 35 years to track to, me down. To, yeah, to track you down, but you know, here we are. Um, but yeah. but yeah, you've got to do that and you've got to have the passion to do that. Yeah, um, exactly. So let's, so we're kind of where you are now with the, um, with, so your co vice chair, is it, of James? That's right. Yeah. Which is the joint yeah. audio media education support. That's right. Can you explain S to us what, spot on. Yeah. what that does? Um, well, basically, it, it, it grew out of two other industry bodies. As with any in industry, the music industry has got lots of uh, supportive bodies for, for the different areas. Um, most of that comes under the umbrella of UK Music now. Right. And UK Music is there to do lobbying to government, right. you know, to make sure that the music industry is as well represented as, as the film industry. Yeah. They've traditionally done a better job than us, but we're, you know, we're getting there. That's enough. Uh, but back in the late 90s, um, APRS was a major... A trade body that represented recording studios and one of the guys there that was into education Dave Wald sadly passed but he he ran Gateway Studios which turned into the Gateway School of Recording tied in with uh, Guildford University and a lot of studio people around London in, in particular kept saying to Dave in the late 90s we're getting so many applications from graduating students how can we possibly judge you know, what's not, not necessarily what's a good student, yeah. but what's a good course, yeah. they're, they're, they're graduating. If we can at least nail down some of the sort of better courses, that gives us a sort of a start point for interviews. Yeah. So Dave came up with this accreditation system that, that we still run, so it's an industry accreditation body. Uh, and I was part of the Music Producers Guild around that time. I'd got persuaded to join the Music Producers Guild by Gus Dudgeon Great. many years before. Um, and that represents, as it says, producers and engineers and so on, and does a great job doing that. Yeah. So, uh, so we kind of joined uh, Dave's accreditation scheme, which had run as a pilot scheme since the late 90s. It's a three year rolling scheme. So the idea is uh, a, a, a course will get an accreditation one year after a visit and a full assessment by industry practitioners. We're not necessarily looking at the academic, we're looking at how relevant is this course to industry and the technology that exists now uh, to help students to sort of take a steady journey I into industry. And spreading that across all of media, really, because we know how few jobs exist 
in hardcore yeah. studios like this. Yeah. So, you know, the advice is generally, you know, do it yourself, start your own. Um, but on film sets and other types of media, we find a lot of students that have studied music technology or production uh, and use that as, 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 as a good base to move their, uh, their knowledge in, into other technologies and other media outlets. Right. But, you know, as you know, audio is needed in so many things so now, many you know, things. when we add yeah. on games and yeah. where we're going with film yeah, sound and, yeah. and all the rest of it. So, uh, so that's what we do. Yeah, we're an industry body made up of industry professionals still running Dave's accreditation scheme. I mean, it's only just passed, unfortunately, but uh, uh, yeah, and we like to think that, no disrespect to others, but we've kind of, in the UK, we feel we've got the cream of the crop. Right. Uh, you know, if, if you imagine that every FE college and every university in some form or shape is running, if not just a music performance course, probably some sort of production or, or engineering course for music, and we've got uh, about 25 or 27 accredited. Wow. So that's probably only, I don't know, 10, 20%, if that. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, it does help the universities with their, their recruitment. Uh, when our practitioners go in, uh, you know, and we, it's an official visit every three years, but we, we stay in touch and are there to help people throughout that three years. It's a kind of... Um, from an academic point of view, it gives the, the team running the course, hopefully some good answers to questions that they were probably talking about themselves. Right. Should we develop a Dolby Atmos room? You know, should yeah. we be doing this? Yeah. You know, and, and, and we come in and kind of probably, well, we certainly support to their management what they definitely want to do. Right. Uh, and we make all kinds of recommendations and suggestions and then you know, one of the big things when when they get reaccredited in in three years' time, hopefully they stay stay with us, is well, you know, how how have you acted out the recommendations from three years ago, yeah. uh, and how's it going? And um, our next Dolby Atmos two years ago was one of the big things that we were encouraging people to to get into, even if it's just a a headphone set up which is which yeah. is possible you yeah. know but but ideally a designed room and our next our next mission that we're rolling out is metadata right which has been rolling on for a long time mm. uh but we are we feel that we're uh, certainly a lot of us in the industry that we're at the point where we're beginning to get on top of it yeah uh and it's been essential really because the, the streaming services and and all the rest of it that, that that people that have taken part in a record need to get paid for you know that's a future fantastic thing yeah. for, because that's the equivalent of me picking up spinning me around and turning it over yeah. and while i'm listening to it i'm reading the credits and i was yeah. listening to a lot of your your material on tidal last night and sometimes the credits come up and sometimes they don't yeah and it's exactly. really difficult to find exactly so to have to have the metadata so because uh, you can't embed it in a wav file at the, well, you can in a broadcast wav um do you, do you know how that might work well yeah well you, you you can embed certain things within uh, at least the isrc code right as, as you yeah. know as you know as a master yeah. engineer it can, can be embedded in, uh, in a wav so if all the identifiers following of the people involved in the record are all registered right you know yeah, and relating to that isc car isrc code um it can work but what we've what we've learned from uh, from one organization that because that, we're doing a, an online conference in a couple of weeks time actually for a, but other people are welcome to join but it's for our accredited course leaders right um there now exists worldwide five different identifiers isrc being just one of them wow um <laughs> now as, as, a, as a performer or a songwriter you probably only need to be embedded in one in one yeah but good for people to know about all five that yeah. cover different areas maybe and different different territories so it's going to be tough catching up on historical stuff. Yeah. But at least if we get it right now going forward, you know, uh, and students of the future generally yeah. of, of, of the industry. Yeah. So we want to we want to try and embed that in curriculum going forward. Yeah. yeah. So there you go, kids. There'll be some jobs for data entry for, yeah. for, for, for the history of music for the next few yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a big task. So that's where we are with James. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking. That's, yeah, no, that's great. That's, and I think that's really important as well. Yeah. Um, because there are, 
I know one of the concerns of a lot of people is there's lots of people going through sort of music university and different sound engineering courses. Yep. And, and the general perception is that there aren't any jobs mm. once you've done that. But there are, aren't there? Right. And there I are. think there's a lot more today. Than, I mean, how many studios were there in London in the 70s when you started? Yeah. Probably... 10, 12, maybe, yeah. I don't know. So I mean, that, that those were your options. It was, you know, the Marquee, Abbey Road. Yeah, uh, and some of the big it, ones are still there, you know, but people often say, yeah, well, all the all the studios are closed down. Well, they haven't. No, they're just... They're, they're just spread out. Yeah, you know, they're just... Or, or, they're not on Dean Street anymore. <laughs> they're, they're in Effing or they're... Yeah, or um, they're in private people's back gardens. Exactly, in there, you know, yeah, and, and yeah. so on. Yeah, there's actually a lot more. And you I know, think, it's become the standard. Obviously, um, you guys have got this great facility here. But people like myself that don't have a commercial facility, mm. we've all got a room somewhere, yeah. either in or connected to our house, that that that, that, that is a good mixing room. Yeah. Uh, you know, depending on 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 the space you've got. I mean, in in I'm in a study at the front of my house. You know, more than two people, and and, and we're struggling. Yeah. But I can still mix in still there, work, and, and I can still prepare things in there, and so on. Yeah. And you know the room, you know how it sounds, you know yeah. your speakers, and that's, and, and that's, that's average for most producers and engineers. Yeah. These days, I would say. Yeah. Even if it's laptop based, you know. Yeah. Are you still affiliated with Strong Room? Or? Uh, not specifically. You know, still still friendly, and and still amongst my first choices if I've got a vocal session to do. Or if someone does want to travel up to Suffolk, yeah, which is often the way, um, but not, no, not not officially, right? Because no. mm. you were there from we're kind of getting backwards here, which is, which <laughs> yeah, is fine. That's all right. So you were there with Ian P and E um, yep. Productions from ninety two to two thousand. That's right. Um, one of their production suites, which which, and they were one of the first to do it actually mm. in the early nineties, uh, and everybody's followed suit. Since I mean, yeah. you, even here, you, you guys have got two rooms it, that yeah, the, the people can come it. in and hire, you know, just to, 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 to do their own thing, probably with their own equipment and laptop. Am I right to say that? Nowadays, not so much, but back but, in the day, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah a lot of people would, yeah, bring, we wouldn't do anything. We'd literally open the door sometimes and let them in. And yeah, then, yeah. Yeah, they'd mic Get up their drums them. and put it yeah. through an interface into the laptop. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of songwriters around these days, definitely, that, 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 that are teched up and you know, ready to travel and, 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 and go wherever and you've kind of got to be, and, and all they really need is a, is a room yeah. that, that is convenient to collaborate with other people. Yeah. Uh, but generally, you know, they're traveling with their own kit. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's go back, so, so, so you're at Marquee, um, working with a ton of artists yeah. there. How, how did you, do you remember first meeting Pete Waterman or how did that kind oh of connection? Because yeah, yeah. um, I, I, know, I don't know Pete Waterman, but I know a lot of people that, yeah. that do know Pete Waterman and he's got nothing but praise for you. Um, oh, that's he's, nice. He's, you mentioned mix engineer, he's like, oh, Phil Harding! It, yeah, it, it, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, yeah um, which is deserving, yeah. obviously. But how did that sort of connection come about? Well, we go back a long way and uh, it's good. People don't often ask this question. And, and another question, just and not that I'm saying we have to ask it, but uh, uh, um, in a, another interview I did, someone asked me how I got into music. Right. Not just the industry, but into music. Which into was, music. And, and, and I was able uh, to actually remember my, uh, my music teacher's name, because so, a lot of artists <laughs> these days are so grateful to their music teachers yeah. at school who, yeah. who have, you know, and, and, and it just... Bing, it came to oh mr bone was a music <laughs> teacher and he came around and gave me piano lessons oh brilliant but um this is how far ian kern and i go back uh, as as teenagers even i think we were maybe 19 or something yeah we got signed because uh, although i was an engineer until kind of a little bit later in the 70s part part of the coming up through the marquee was they would give you down studio time right to you know to to, to learn the trade yourself so you could bring a band in, you, you could do a few bits and pieces. So on downtime, uh, Ian and I had been co-writing. We came up with uh, a bunch of demos, a few of which, you know, turned into, into records. And we went out and looked for a publishing deal. And we went to Martin and Coulter. Right. Bill Martin, Phil Coulter, yeah. does that? Or yeah, you, that yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and they had an office uh, on the South Bank up in this famous building where uh, Jeffrey Archer was the floor above them right <laughs> and they were so so for those who don't know they're the people uh, songwriters behind uh, Bay City Rollers yeah. uh, Puppet on a String yeah you know yeah, uh, uh, yeah. yeah like, typical kind of you know 60s pop writers you know moved into the 70s 
you know, really uh, done well with the Bay City Rollers. So uh, <clears throat> one of their main guys, Richard Gillinson, um, we went in, played the tracks to him, uh, and Bill Martin in particular could see, I think, the potential in myself and Ian becoming another Martin and Coulter. Right. So they, so they signed us on a, on a short-term deal. We were sitting there one day having a meeting with Richard, and in burst this character, which is Pete Waterman, obviously, <laughs> with a red leather jacket, matching red leather trousers. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, and he's come in to have a meeting with Bill, and uh, at that point, because Pete, as well as being a like a mecca DJ, he's done all sorts of things in his background that you know that led on to the the PWL empire and the yeah. success. Uh, he was also a promoter, right? You know, and literally going round round the shops and so on. Yeah. Uh, and he and he, and he burst into our meeting because well, I guess Bill was in there as well, and he was promoting. I think it was Starship Trooper, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. It was it was a Euro disco record. And, and I'm pretty sure it was a Friday, and, and it was like, I think we're going to get a jar position, Bill, on Sunday. Yeah, 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 we've done enough, we've done enough. <laughs> and that was my first meeting. Of, <laughs> like this, this, you know. And you clearly remember the red leather jacket. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. Which you yeah. would, of course. Which you carried on wearing for, for a number of years, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was, that was the, the very first meeting. Um, and very, very soon after that, or possibly it was even the same time, but I think it was after... Uh, he got a job as A and R at Magnet Records. Right. You know, a, a lot of records there that if people wanted to research, that he signed and was behind. But uh, there was one band in particular called uh, the JLN Band. Right. You got that one? Uh, yeah. I, you I, got that I'm one. Oh, I don't I'm, mean many people that got that one. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the. I got to sing. I'm trying to think of the record. I got to sing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they had signed them as. Uh, yeah, they, they, were, they weren't all family, but it was like trying to be the Jackson Five, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, and Pete booked the. By this time, we had two studios at the Marquee, uh, the upstairs mix room. I thought just to just to mix this record, but in came this wonderful uh, soul singer, Jimmy Thomas. Mm. Yeah, you heard of him? Yeah. He came over yeah. here with Ike and Tina Turner as part of their review and stayed. Yeah. And after this this session, we became really good friends and did lots of things together. Right. So basically, and, and this was an, an early example, although I was unaware of it at the time, you know, Pete wasn't happy with the lead vocal from, from, from the band. Yeah. So there's no band members there. He's paying Jimmy to come in and replace the lead vocal oh. on the record. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how determined he was. I'm going to get this record sounding as good as I can. Yeah. And it's not sounding good enough to, going back to the Gus Hutchins thing almost, you know, I'm going to come up with a budget and we'll hire a studio. And I don't think he'd hired it for me. It was just like you know, somewhere central to go. Um, so that was the first session we did together. Wow! You know, and that and that, and that was fantastic. And then after, not long after that, he he teamed up with Peter Collins. You know, a lot again. Do your research. There's a lot of massive grounding hits. I mean, but but worldwide hits that 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 yeah, P Peter think... Collins produced under the management uh, uh, umbrella, Loose End Productions. It was called yeah. of Pete Waterman. But the thing is that what, uh, I mean, I, I called up with Peter Collins last year in Nashville and I'm sure he won't mind me saying, um, you know, he was a great producer. He literally lived across the road to, to the Marquee in right. Dean Street. Right. So that was one of the reasons he started coming in. But, you know, we became really good friends and did a lot of projects together un under the, uh, the management eye of, of, of Waterman. But even what used to happen at PWL, which, which surprises people, it was happening then, but but they weren't co-producers. Right. It was producer and manager. Yeah. You know, in 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 in, in the guise of a, a production company. Um, but Waterman would come in at the end of the day when he's finished in the office, and 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 hear what Pete's done. And if he wasn't happy, or yeah. if he th had ideas or wanted to change things, it it got changed. Yeah. You know, because there was. Uh, there was no arguing with him, really, and that, and that, and that really goes <laughs> you further don't argue on. With the, yeah, don't in, argue with the red leather. You know, but <laughs> even, even in those days, I mean, it, it was the breaking point um, when, when they worked on the second musical youth album uh, in America, you know, for, for Pete and Pete. Mm. But, uh, yeah, we were doing a musical youth session, and, uh, and I was surprised, you know, Pete came in at the end of the day, and Pete Collins and I, you know, been working on it all day, so sounding great to us. You know, and it's, no, you know, we need this, and I don't like that keyboard part, and, you know, 
he, he, he had a vision, same as uh, in many ways to Gus, but in a much more kind of straight ahead pop way yeah. of, of how records should sound. Yeah. You know, uh, Pete Burns out of Dead or Alive used to call him Woolworth's ears. <laughs> you know, ears. Waterman with Woolworth's ears. <laughs> he knows what's going to get the kids into Woolworths on a Saturday and to he, buy a record. And he did. <laughs> and he was and he was right. And I think people yeah. underestimate or just aren't aware of how damn hard he worked. Oh God, yeah. As well. I mean, yeah. he'd, he'd be so he'd be you know in the office during the day, and then yeah, like yeah. I say, going into the studio yeah. at the end of the day and and changing things, and then off to the clubs in the evening and That's either right. DJing himself and promoting it or, or That's right. he lived, lived he, and breathed. I mean, even you know, once we started at uh, PWL, well, I mean, we had the first year at at, at the Marquee. That's where the Dead or Alive record was made. But once that was clearly going to be a massive hit and we were working on the Youthquake album there was a but we had been there almost a year you know working on Dead or Alive, uh, Divine and Hazel yeah. Dean and other records um, there was obviously clearly a discussion largely pushed from what I can make out by quite rightly by Mike Stock of you know we should have our own studio Pete we shouldn't be yeah. paying the marquee yeah uh, and if we've got what looks like a solid royalty income coming from the Dead or Alive single and album, surely that's a solid base the to, 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 to set up. To so that's what happened, and, and I didn't take much persuading to, <laughs> to join them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that was a general sort of, you know, when I first met Waterman and that general transition. And um, ev even before he got together with Stock and Aitken, uh, we spent the best part of six months at the Marquee with Lamont Dozier, right. who he brought wow. over. Uh, so when he so when he split with uh, Peter Collins, and was kind of in limbo a bit, um, yeah, he brought uh, he was a big fan of of, of Motown. Obviously, yeah. that's yeah. That, hence the the idea of uh, PWL Empire and and it being a British equivalent to Motown. Yeah. That that was his yeah. vision and and dream. And uh, yeah, and Lamont came over and we did a number of records. None 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 of them got away, uh, as we say, mm. in terms of hits and success other than one song uh, that, that, that Lamont wrote and Pete published. So it kind of, in retrospect, it probably paid for the whole trip and the whole, the whole thing. And, uh, and that was, is it Superstitious or Superstition for um, uh, Alison Moyer? Oh, right. Big Alison Moyer hit. Wow. That was a Lamont Dozier song. Mm. Uh, and Lamont demoed it, not with us at the Marquee, but with Ian Kerno, funny enough. Yeah. So Ian and I, uh, you know, for some years have been on the periphery with bits and pieces with Waterman before the whole PWL thing. But when we, but that, but that, that year at the Marquee and when we started at PWL Studios, uh, Ian was the uh, MD for Talk Talk. Right. And touring the world with them. Yeah. Fantastic. Man. Which is brilliant, you know. Yeah. And at the point where our Fairlight programmer, Pete was moving up from, I don't know, it was either two to three or one to two, I can't quite remember. Uh, and, and Mike turned around and said, I, I really don't want to learn a whole new version and I'd kind of had enough things by then. Yeah. So, uh, and that coincided when, when Talk Talk said to Ian, oh, we're not going to do any more touring. And he wasn't a full, yeah. fully pledged member. He was just, you know, hired, hired MD. So, uh, so I said to Pete, you know, well, look, Pete, he, he, you know, Ian, he's been touring with, with a, uh, uh, a Wurzweil system. Have I got that right name? Kurtzwell. Kurtzwell system, yeah. that's it. Uh, you know, a lot of it programmed for, for, for stuff from the albums for, for the tour as well as the as well as the keyboard. I'm sure it, you know, give him a bit of time in to get his head around the fair light. Yeah, we'll think like that out. You know, Ian's story is he, you know, went home and digested the yeah. the catalogue basically. <laughs> or the the, the, the manual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. So it really spin me round was a big turning point for, for, for it everything. Was. You, you split away from Marquee. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah. And, and the fact that we've done a whole album as well, you know, the UK yeah. album. Yeah. Um, it was clear future income that Pete was able to persuade his, um, I never met him, but he obviously had a mad Irish bank manager right? who was willing, you know, in those, in those days to, uh, you want to buy an SSL? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And why do yeah. you want to buy an SSL? Right. Uh, okay. Well, that sounds uh, fair enough, Pete, or whatever, <laughs> you know, and, and Pete managed to get the money to, uh, to take over what was an existing studio at the time, the Vineyard. Yeah. Uh, and I had done a couple of sessions there, but uh, yeah, it's an old power station behind, um, Borough, Down in Borough, yeah. uh, um, station, and 
the guy that owned the studio was trying to rebuild uh, the studio upstairs because what it was was a control room that overlooked a studio area that was down on a different level. So, right. so there was two levels in the building and he decided, no, we don't need that big studio uh, area anymore because it's get, all getting a bit more tight with technology and drum machines. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if he'd run out of money or Pete just persuaded him, well, well give it to me. You know, I'll rent the building from you mm. and we'll finish off the studio and, 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 and you know, and, and, and off we went. Good. So good timing and lots of, lots of things yeah. coming yeah. together all triggered by that. Well, the first number one for, for Stock Ake and Waterman. And let's talk about um, another thing I think gets massively overlooked is Pete Burns and his voice. Mm. And I was listening to Spin Me Round and Youthquake and a yeah. lot of the other hits last night. And I think he's got one of the best voices ever to come out of yeah. this country is it's Tom Jones level. It's incredible. It's, it's yeah. absolutely, it's so he, powerful. He is underrated, incredibly powerful. And and there was no, uh, in recording him, there was no, I don't know what it was like live, but there was no perception in his mind of anything technical or a run through. Right. You couldn't do a run through. No. Because all, all he knew was, oh, the track's there, bang. And he's, ah. So uh, <laughs> as an engineer, you know, I mean, obviously I learn, yeah. quickly this is uh, the gay level for uh, you know <laughs> yeah right yeah. you know make sure it's well down hit recall straight away just in case yeah yeah he really projected you know yeah. and you'd have to get him to stand back a bit from the 87 and um yeah. i could only find one live um recording of him actually and that was yeah. a version of um before he was working with you guys the album before yeah I don't know what it was called they did a cover of that's the yeah. way i like it yeah and there's a live version of that with a horn section and a full band oh. and everything and i thought okay this is the bit where we see Phil's magic and the vocal's not going to be, it's going to be yeah. this, but no, it's just absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, oh, and um, he was great at tracking himself, you know, yeah. fair, fair play to him and many others came in that, 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 that were like that as well. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realise is that Mike Stock is a great singer. Mm. So on both of those albums, no disrespect to uh, the rest of the band, but any backing vocals and harmonies you hear are likely Mike Stock. And Pete couldn't really get his head round harmonies i mean right. he might even you know mike stock would do it and you, you could maybe get him to sing along but you wouldn't get any more than that and there's one part somewhere in in spin me around where there's some clear backing vocals yeah. and it's pretty much all mike stock that's all mike yeah and that was the great thing with you know throughout w with mike you know he was a, a singer and a, a a top liner and a lyricist so he'd always be the one you know driving the vocal sessions and 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 really getting involved in that yeah, and, and Matt was a fantastic guitarist as well. I fantastic guitarist, that. and uh, they were both good on the keyboard. Yeah. You know, they both did keyboard parts. Matt programmed a lot of the drum parts, and and, and Matt, you know, I think pretty sure by his own uh, by his own views, you know, a great sounding board yeah. for Mike. But the majority of the uh, certainly the lyrics, I mean, they would work on top lines together as well. Uh, would have been Mike, yeah. I mean, you know, Matt can sing could sing i'm sure but 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 generally mike was the one that had it there and could sing down the talk back to people right you yeah. know which uh you know in those six months with lamont dozier it was it was quite frightening for for vocalists <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. you know yeah. lamont dozier's yeah, voice coming down the talk back <laughs> Fuck, i can't see it as good as that <laughs> yeah, yeah it was hilarious but uh, <laughs> i i have found in you know in my years of producing and doing vocal sessions myself it's actually, you've got to be quite brave, even as an engineer and as a producer, to actually, if you're really sure that this is how it needs to be sung or, or, or someone needs some help, sing it down the talk back. Because if you're a particularly bad vocalist, you know, hopefully the person on the other side is, is going to, oh, they want it that way and they'll get it better. Yeah. Yeah. But for a great vocalist to be on the talk back is uh, it's <laughs> quite intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's a, so there's a great, um, there's a great story in your, in your first book, which is this one from the factory floor, which is, is yeah. fantastic. And it, it kind of reminded me of the scene in the Blues Brothers very early in the film where um, he's asking where the original Blues Mobile is and he's like, well, I traded it for a microphone. And he's like, okay, I can see that. So you go up with Pete Waterman to Cowrec 
Oh god! With yeah. the intention of buying a console, yeah, and you come back with a microphone, yeah, so, so, <laughs> and that was pretty much the only yeah. microphone. Yeah, yet, maybe a SM57, but what? that's pretty much the only microphone you had yeah. at the studio for what nine years or yeah, the Cowrex Soundfield, and it's yeah. on credits on on the back of records. Yeah, it is. You've seen yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. Was that part of the deal? That's part of the deal. It? Wow. So Pete, <laughs> even with buying the microphones, Pete's yeah. doing a deal. He's wheeling a deal in. So, yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> and of course, the next one when we when we you know built the other studio and and they kept seeing all these credits on hit records they just came along and just gave us another one. <laughs> oh, you got a second studio now here's here's a mic and don't worry about any money you know um but yeah we i mean the i don't know how pete got persuaded into this it must have been a calric salesman or whatever but he got which is unusual for pete really he got um you know persuaded to come and look at the calric desk because Ben in Bjorg has just bought one right. out of ABBA. Yeah. He was a massive ABBA fan. Yeah. And, and, and he said to me, look, um, you know, it's all the way up in Burnley, Phil, but, you know, I've, I've, I've committed to go and look at this desk, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and you know, do we want this or the SSL? And I said, well, almost certainly the SSL, but if you, you know, if you really want to look at it, and I happened to be up there, funnily enough, up of, you know, a bit further in, in Blackpool, uh, recording with Ty the Tigers of Pentang. Oh, wow. Who had uh, the father of the guitarist had a studio up there. So I managed, I only had to come from Blackpool to, to Burnley and then, so, but within five minutes of walking in and the guy starting talking tech on the desk, Pete disappeared. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> yeah, he's just, oh, I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, I've got to take all right, hello. Fair enough. <laughs> and then, you know, some hours later, he comes back and, he, and he's been in the R&D room talking talking to the developers and right. the engineers in there uh, and they're explaining to him about you know developing this four capsule mic yeah. for orchestras and all the rest of it and it's going to be the best microphone in the world and and all the rest of it and and that was it he came That's back it. at the he, you know we're, we're on our way out and he said I've done a deal for the microphone Phil and uh you know we'll let him know about the desk <laughs> let's pop into SSL on the way back so he got the microphone at half price because it was something like five or six grand Over a lot of money yeah half Still price are. And, uh, and, 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 and I promise to credit them on, on records. Great. Fantastic <laughs> microphone there. So I assume, yeah. I assume you were just using the front capsule for yes. vocals. Yes, we, and... we, we just used the front two capsules. I mean, it had this wonderful uh, um, interface box that was nice, nice and easy to kind of just mount in the studio. And we just simply had a routine of, uh, we take the feed from those two channels into two channels on the SSL and mono it down to one track. Right. And that was it, job yeah. done. And the only time that we ever took the trouble to come directly out of the Calrec box straight onto tape, partly because I wanted to, you know, never had time to experiment, you know, back then, it was so busy. But we were doing, uh, we were working on Rick Astley's second album and we were recording Hold Me In Your Arms. And Rick was saying, because, you know, the routine was to track everything and, you know, lots of the girls doing harmonies and all the rest of it. And, and, and he said to me, I really want to try and get a single track, you know, real kind of upfront, um, almost dry vocal. Right. Uh, and, and so we, that's the first time I actually, so we recorded it in stereo, you know, took the two channels direct into tape right, and, and, and avoided the SSL. I mean, people, you know, SSL won't like this, but you know, historically, it, when I was engineering, there was a lot of criticism of the mm. SSL. And it took a lot of us to feed back to SSL to say that the E-series, which, you know, which, okay, it got a reputation, it'd been going for years. Yeah. The general reputation was it was great for pop. Right. But for those of us that are engineers that have been working on it daily and constantly for many years, many of us came to the conclusion it's too harsh. The EQ is too harsh. Yeah. Can you please develop something that's at least towards the smoothness of a Neve yeah. or something like yeah. that. Um, and, 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 you know, hence came the G-Series. Yeah. So it's astonishing to me now that the, the people are selling and still raving about the E-Series. E whereas whereas yeah. in the day, we, a lot of engineers were very critical of it. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was interesting. I mean, I didn't carry on doing that because continually recording lots of multi-track vocals in stereo just for the sake of coming out of the Calrio box <laughs> was OTT. Yeah. But, but it worked for Rick on that, on, on that one track, right. Hold Me In Your Arms, yeah. So you're at the Vineyard in Borough mm. and that's when it just... Yeah. Um, at one point in 1989, 
uh, you achieve 27% of the entire UK singles market. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> Which yeah. is absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, over 100 UK top 40 hits, 150 million records sold, 13 number ones. Yeah. And there's one particular song I want to mention because so I was, I was, my personal journey was I was sort of growing up through the 80s and, and towards the end of the 80s I was starting to develop a different music taste. And by the yeah. time 1990 hit, I'd gone completely down the acid jazz road. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. I was listening to Jim Miracle and the James Taylor Corset yeah, yeah. and got into the Hammond. And, 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 and that's and, one of the reasons that, 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 that we tailed off as it were right mm. but up until that point it was i was a huge fan of the music um, and that started with the first with the first dead or alive yeah. record spin me around um and mel and kim i loved i thought that, that was that had its own unique sound yeah. they yeah. somehow their personalities seemed to come out in the record and they just yeah. sounded like a couple of really lovely girls yeah yeah, um, yeah. But it was kind of, it got to a point, I think maybe after the Rick Astley and the Kylie hits where a lot of the, the rest of the sort of music industry were um, saying, it, you know, it's, it's a, yeah. just cranking, someone's yeah. just pushing buttons and you're cranking yeah. a handle and these hits are just coming out. Yeah. We were accused of using the same backing track a lot as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone's sitting Short back with their, with their yeah. feet up and people yeah. didn't realise, now, now I think people are starting to realise that, okay, this is, this is as important to the history of recorded music as Motown and the Beatles, and any you know mm. anything of, mm. of of that kind of um, level. And there was a single came out which pricked my ears up again in 1987, which was called Roadblock. Oh yeah, yeah. And that was a fantastic record. Yeah, yeah. And it was sort of released anonymously; no one really knew who it was. Yeah. And then I remember I'd heard it on the radio, and I loved it. And then I remember seeing the video on the it might have been on yeah. top of the pops or yeah. something. I saw the yeah. video, and I thought. Yeah, that I'm sure I've seen. I've seen sort of Pete Waterman in magazines. That looks yeah. like Pete Pete Waterman yeah. in the front of that. And then bought yeah. the record, and it was Stock Aitken Waterman, yeah. Yeah. and that got rave reviews from all the kind of sort of trendy music press. And it, and I got the impression for that that it was kind of Pete Waterman going. That's right to the, <laughs> to, to everyone that it, was kind it was, of criticising. It was a, it was a the, kickback to all the all the criticism. Yeah, uh, to say you know we, we can make any type of record. Yeah, you know and. Uh, and it was Tilly Rutherford, you know, who was the label manager that was, it was partly his idea in terms of marketing it, you know, let's, let's do something that sounds like an old lost record, yeah. you know, and, and we had just put it out there anonymously, but specifically marketed at the DJs that would get excited yeah. about something that was rare, yeah. you know, um, and of course they all, yeah, they all got they all got drawn into it, and yeah. then lo and behold, it was Stock Aiken Awards. <laughs> Stock Aiken Awards. I mean, but, it, but, but in in terms of the building and the rest of the team, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, everyone, it was a great record, as you say, everybody loved it. But I think for, for some of us, we're a bit confused as to, you know, yeah, what's this? What's going on? Why almost? Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, you're the producers and writers for so many great artists. Why why be the artists as well? I mean, I, I don't, mm. I'm not sure if they've ever been asked that question. Uh, the most important thing was the kickback against the, kickback the, against the critics. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but then they got persuaded to do a follow up, which wasn't so good. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. They got to. Uh, yeah, that was number a hundred in the charts. I think the follow up picked that. But, 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 yeah. but, but, but uh, whatever. But, but yeah, but Robot was was fantastic, yeah. and I just love the kind of fingers up to the critics as yeah. well. That was that. It was, was to show that they could do it. I mean, yeah. You know, because people forget that, as you say, we went from dead or alive, out and out high energy. You know, marketed to the to the gay clubs, like some of the other records before it. Um, you know, very much that high energy sound. You know, then we went to to Princess and yeah, I was I, the I soul was... sound. You know, it, when people say there's a PWL sound, well, it, there isn't. Not not really. No, there, there's, there's lots of different sounds. Yeah, if you compare the Princess record, say I'm your number one, with I should be so lucky. Yeah. There's no way you'd. Th yeah. That's not the same. It's, no, it's not writing day. or production. You know. It's it's. It's, and that's what I loved about the, the, the production at the time as well, is that the, the, and we were listening back to some songs the other week and sort of analysing them. And across the board, the production of the music suits the song and yeah. the artist perfectly yeah. every time. It's, well, it's, 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 it's all about that sort of vocal and... and yeah, referring back to Mel and Kim is, is, is a good example because... Again, that's what uh, Mike, Matt, and Pete were really good at doing. As 
what's the if if they're writing for someone because generally they they didn't generally have songs hanging around mm. it was all we're going to work with this artist so we're writing for this artist for them um and mannequin was a great example of getting to know the girls getting to know their characters you know yeah. fun and bubbly and all the rest of it yeah and writing for that not writing something that <laughs> Doesn't relate it doesn't to suit them. them. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and that really comes across in the in the records as well. Yeah. You, you listen to Respectable, um, and you cut you you knew Mel and Kim. Yeah. you just knew them. Yeah, um, and they were really good at bringing out the characters. You know, yeah. and uh, I think for a lot of people, uh, you know, especially songwriters, dare I say, it does. It, you know, I'm convinced it makes a big difference if, you know, because just the no disrespect to a lot of artists, you know, the ego of the artist, if they're presented by a songwriter or, you know, we've written this for you. Yeah. You know, this isn't something that so-and-so turned down a month ago or whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. we've, written it, we've written this for you. And, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, as much as we refer to it a lot and it's a big story that's talked about and I won't go through it again here, but uh, I Should Be So Lucky was, was another great example. It was, uh, they were determined not to pull something off the shelf yeah, and so you know, for, the, for the viewers that might not know, so Kylie was flown over from Australia, put in yeah. the studio by Pete Waterman. You guys didn't have a clue who she was because you'd never seen Neighbours. No. And it's not until the afternoon that she's flying home that Pete Waterman comes back and goes, how's the Kylie record? And you're all like, uh, what? Yeah. Hey. Well, he'd bug it off. Yeah. <laughs> Friday, he'd bug it off every Friday, you know, to up north. So yeah. uh, whatever year we're talking about, 86. 86. I, I mean, think, I think yeah. we might have had those... The beginning of the mobile phone the clunky things yeah but 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 as far as i know no no one could track him down but there's a, a few variations of the story but anyway you know on the spot as you say and she's going home and um and they had to write a song on the spot mm. you know within within hours yeah well, i think mike stock i remember reading an interview it might be, i'm sure it was mike stock and he said that they wrote the song in 40 minutes and yeah. recorded it in under an hour yeah and she never heard the finished song until they shot the music video. No, so other people say that uh, when Kylie walked out, she had no idea of what was the verse, oh, what was the or, you know, it, it, because it was done in sections. Yeah. You know, write that bit, Kylie come in, sing that bit, please, you know, great. You know, just but, give, yeah, us, but, give us another 10 minutes. <laughs> but it's an incredible song and st been stuck in our heads for, for a week. Yeah. And, I mean, this, but, yeah. There's four key changes before the first yeah. chorus yeah. comes in. So it's like, it's what? Yeah, yeah. When you look at it sort of technically yeah. on a bit of paper, it's like, no, that's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess, that, and that was the genius of, of the songwriting. It, it was. And, 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 you know, unless you sit down on a keyboard or on a guitar, you don't realise uh, the amount of sophistication behind some of those songs. Yeah. You know, and that, yeah. was, that was why the criticism hurt so much. Yeah. You know, but, 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 but that sort of stemmed from Pete in the early days continually coming in and saying, Guys, I need the chorus to lift. I need it to lift, you know. Yeah. Uh, and 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 the route that Mike and Matt eventually found for that, you know, pretty quickly was, oh well, we'll, we'll, we'll say, do a we'll key say, change we'll, up into we'll the chorus, yeah. you know. Yeah. But you you sit down and and and, and look at 80, 90 percent of the certainly the the pop orientated songs, nearly all got key changes in them, you know. And there's 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 some great examples. There's you know some may not be quite as good, but one. Um, one of the Kylie ones, I, th I think, is a particularly good example. Because the thing, but the thing with that, it used to drive myself and Ian Potty, because then something would come down and say, "We'll do a club version of that." <laughs> so you know, so so Ian would take a look at it, and you know, as you know, in club, you just you want to be pounding, and quite often with the, with the bass, just everything on, yeah. you know, in, at least yeah. in one key, yeah. if not, exactly. you know, yeah. if, if if not the minor key. <laughs> Yeah. And continually having to deal with these bloody key changes. Yeah. So was... you got. Let's talk a bit about the twelve-inch singles because I love the twelve-inch singles, and I bought this every Stock Aitken Walkman record I bought. I bought the twelve-inch singles, and quite often, especially with some of the Dead or Alive stuff, there were more than one twelve-inch single. Yeah. There were yeah, lots yeah. of different versions. Often a series. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I loved them was because it quite often gave me a window into how it was put together. And we've just listened yeah. to a, to a yeah. section of exposed drum programming yeah. from something in my house. Yeah. And it's and. I just yeah. remember, and now I can easily loop it in logic. Back then, I was that style, oh, and yeah. I was like, "What's oh. that? And what's the? Yeah. We're talking about the triple, the triplet on the bass." Yeah. And yeah. as a piece of drum programming, it's it's. I mean, why the hell that hasn't been sold to death? I've got no, I've got no yeah. idea. It's yeah. in, it's incredible. But that's you know, um, as, as as an engineer and a, and, a, and a remixer, that's 
you know, the extended club version gives you a great opportunity to really pull out things that even, I mean, that sound that you were pulling out there, you probably can't hear that in the main record. No. But you in your breakdown in the, section yeah. in the club, and that's version, why I love the, That's why I love the twelve inches. And so, yeah. how did you? What was the process for doing that? Because now it's easy. We've got a mouse yeah. and a keyboard. How did you do that? When because we were you on analog tape. At, uh, analog tape. So, so you. So how do you mixing eight or sixteen bars at a time? Wow. Make sure that however that bit ends, so you're continually editing and thinking, oh Christ, you know, I got it wrong with that echo because it's cut off on the edit, and then you go back and do it again. <laughs> Until, you know, and, th and that's how, uh, you know, famously I talk about how long a Spin Me Round took to mix, mm. but that's, that's how it was done. There, there, there was, okay, it was recorded as a three or four minute song, but when it was initially mixed and presented to people, it, it was the six or seven minutes. Right. Um, and Pete, like, you know, th that's his DJ background again. Yeah. He yeah. liked to work that way. And, and right through until maybe... Rick and Kylie, everything was mixed 12 inch first. Right. Okay. And at the, at the back of the book, uh, the PDOL factory book, my assistant, Les, very kindly gives us an insight into a day of me doing uh, a Kylie a hand yeah. on your heart mix. Yeah. And Pete had said to me, this was the second album, you know, we, we, we need to get back towards the clubs. And I said, well, do you want me to, you know, as we did some years back more, just do the extended version first and then and then cut the radio version radio from it. down from that. So yeah. that's what we did. And, yeah. and when Pete came in, and it comes back to what you're saying about the elements, he can understand the elements of the track because you've got to bear in mind that he's not been in the studio overseeing every element. Exactly. You know, yeah. he's, he's there at the start of the day saying, we need to do this, we need to get that done, and he'll come back in and review it at the end of the day. But he's, that, his daytime in the studio was... was 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 rare yeah so other than what his ears are hearing when he's presented with a, a monitor mix or whatever he's not he's not aware of every single element right but in the extended club version he can be yeah you know because yeah. because you're introducing them kind yeah. of one at a time yeah so yeah just 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 continually hopping onto the half inch two track and and editing and, and going that way and again another reason about the whole collaborative team of what you were doing. So you've got yeah. Pete Waterman coming in at the end of the day with fresh ears. Yeah, exactly. And listening to it and going, no, don't like that. Yeah. Or this is yeah. fantastic, yeah. but bring that up a bit. Yeah. And, and and then he'll do that again at the mix. Right. You know, and, and all the mix guys will say the same thing, you know. So it'll give you the time to set the mix up. Great. Mm. He'll come in and you know, what well, he knows or knew that Channel One was the kick drum. Right. So you knew the first thing you'd do is go over and turn that up 5 dB. <laughs> <laughs> so... And, you know, every time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so you had to, as an engineer, be prepared for that. So you've probably mixed deliberately the kick drum down a couple of dB to where you know it's going to gonna end up. Right. But as, as you will know as an engineer as well, uh, but then things have to start chasing it. Yeah. And that's why so many of the records, apart from the sort of vinyl aspect, so many of the records are, are fairly bass light. Yeah. Because you can only end up chasing the kick... With, with the bass to the point where you know it's not it's not going to work on vinyl especially yeah. if, if it's mainly a radio record yeah um but yeah no i mean he's he, he's walked in on on many a mix for me back in the day and oh, yeah even there was even one mel and kim mix are you fucking joking <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think i've got it sounding really good you know but um you know off, off, often that would be after the pub that was the problem you know, so you so you'd be in there mixing from like possibly all day or certainly you know the afternoon, and 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 they've gone down the pub at ten. I mean, most of us would would try and get down the pub and come back, and I can't remember which Mel and Kim mix it was now. It wasn't wasn't showing out, but anyway, but cert but certainly even with showing out, I remember that uh, that I hadn't gone far enough right for him because you know we we, we were trying to make a record to sound like the Chicago house records that had yeah. just come in, which, which, you know, we had this fantastic connection with, with Pete Tong who, right. yeah. you know, would, br would bring stuff yeah. down, you know, and say, oh, this is, this, you know, the, this is the new sound coming in. And, um, and I ended up having to sample, you know, if you listen to that showing out track, there's, there's the brass and a lot of sort of scratching, yeah. 
yeah. you know, which have actually come off the records that Pete Tong brought in because right. because the guys hadn't and programmed that. Right. You know, they'd written yeah. a sort of okay, a strangely shaped uh, a pop song. Mm. You know, in that in that dance mode, but then didn't didn't really have the the power of the samples that uh, that were on the Chicago records. So. Um, and that was a very unique sound as well, and, it's, and I think it got it sort of got renamed yeah. London House at some at some, yes. at some point. Some, but the, the Mel and Kim records were it was a yeah. it was a totally unique. It was almost a genre sort of engineered for yeah. them. Almost. Well, I mean, like, like like Pete did with uh, you know with High Energy and and and, and the Gay Club records, he, he brought it from underground to overground. Yeah. So yeah. okay, some of those initial Chicago House records, you know, Farley, Jackmaster Funk, you know, they were big. But they weren't as big as, uh, you know, in terms of chart position and yeah. and and, uh, and so on as, as Mel and Kim and the, and and that's really, you know, it's from that point onwards that you can begin to say, well, that's the PWL sound, a kind of mixture of house and pop. You know, we didn't we did revisit High Energy a few more times and and Soul a bit, but that really, mm. from Rick, Rick onwards, that became the main bedded sound because. Yeah. Because it just works so well with a pop song, you know. And, and although you might not have been as hardcore house, just those basic elements of the house drum beats and the percussion and the style of bass and the, and the you know, and then the basic keyboards, mm. yeah, fit to almost anything, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah. but it got you know, in my view, it got over pumped by it, and went too pop in 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 the Kylie and uh, what and J Jason. Barely. I mean, it, it was there with the Jason records, but we they were able to add uh, guitars and things to yeah. to make that work for him. But yeah. uh, but the thing is that we, you know, Kylie became so big, we lost the clubs right. on DJ support at, at that point. Right. And and anyone, anyone that follows the Kylie career of you know being the, the the out and out pop, and then hand on your heart was was leaning back towards the clubs mm. and Pete realised he needed to get back into the clubs yeah. to really, you know, to really drive every aspect of the marketing and promotion. And by the time we're on album three and we get to something like Step Back in Time, mm. you know, Pete's come down and, 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 and said, well, we've got so far with this, uh, but I don't want you to just mix what's here. I want, I want you and Ian Phil to treat it like one of your remixes. So, you know, pull it apart, reprogram whatever you need and, you know, within reason, put on whatever samples we can get away with or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all, all, all the basic elements of the track are there from Mike and Matt, but all of the the kind of, you know, almost sounding a lot more clubby than she was before mm. uh, uh, had come from herself and Ian. And then by the fourth album, he was trying to get back into the clubs even, even harder. harder and, yeah. and, uh, but as you said, like by the time Acid House and everything else came along, it, it yeah, just it was, we couldn't really. Uh, it was a different you know, world for them. A different could, decade as well. You I couldn't guess, have so an Acid it, House yeah. Kylie record. I mean, you might yeah. have done an Acid House Kylie <laughs> remix, remix, maybe, but yeah. you couldn't. You couldn't make the main radio record like yeah. that, you know. And by the early nineties, Kylie and, and Jason were ready to to move on. You yeah. Know? Um, but again, for, fantastic songs. I mean, we were listening to um, especially for you yeah. Yeah. the other day. Um, yeah. Anyone, any snobby musician that slags mm. that record off, mm. you give them an acoustic guitar and okay, fucking play it. Yeah, play it, work it out. They're gonna struggle. Yeah, it's yeah. a, it's a. Yeah. And some of the bass lines we were listening to, respectable was one of them. Again, yeah. you give that, you give a. I know it's yeah. keyboard bass, synth bass, but you give a high end session bass player a bass guitar and go play that bass line. Yeah. They're gonna listen to it and go. Yeah, what's what going on? Is going on? <laughs> <laughs> Where's one? Yeah, but it, again, it perfectly suits yeah. the it yeah. perfectly suits the record. Um, so, what, what, what was a sort of working day like for for you? So, you got the SSL. What, what were you using for monitoring at the time? Um, well, I was down in the uh, the bunker room, as we right. called it. Uh, Ian was in the sub bunker, and the guys were up in the borough. Yeah. So those are the main three kind of rooms. Uh, well, again, Les describes it really well. I mean, you, you know, he, he, he takes us through the day with the hand on your heart, Kylie mix. Uh, my day was starting the gym. Right. Across the road. 
uh, the Dave Prowse gym, the guy that was the in the Prowse, dark, yeah, yeah, Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Green Cross Code man. Yeah. I remember him coming in my school. Literally and was like, opposite. Oh. <laughs> Everyone's going, oh, it's Darth Vader. He's yeah. like, oh, for God's sake, I'm the Green Cross Code man. <laughs> <laughs> he was brilliant. Yeah. And, um, and, and Les would know basically uh, everything that would need setting up as a start point for me. So, so the six auxiliary sends on the SSL were all going somewhere specific, you know, 224, uh, you know, ambience from the, from the um, AMS. Yeah. Uh, pull check EQs um, inserted across the kick and snare. So a lot, so a lot of the onboard stuff and the outboard stuff, it, he knew exactly how to set it up. I mean, the point is me, sitting there while he's doing all that. Yeah. So hence, you know, yeah. so I'd start, start with that. <laughs> and I'd walk <laughs> in and, 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 all, and everything would have been grouped to the eight SSL groups as well. Right. Drum group, bass group, guitars, keys, etc., etc. So that was, uh, you know, and I've talked to a lot of engineers since then, you know, who, who hate that kind of system. Right. And I've carried on that sort of system ever, ever since. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously I have a Pro Tools mix template. Yeah. Is is the equivalent now to what yeah. I'm talking so about there. there. Yeah. Um where you've got the template and you just bring all your audio into it and everything's there ready to go. So so that would be the the, the start point, you know. And you know, obviously there'd be a three or four minute radio record and I've got to get to know it and, 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 and do everything I've got to do. But uh, you know, in particular on one like that, then I've got to think about okay. Where are things going round and round the most? Generally, that's going to be the outro choruses. They at least learn to give us three or four choruses at the end, so you add more than just eight bars to play with, you yeah. know. And generally, you'd, you, you'd start your, your extended intro, you know, at the end and build up. Right. So in as much as, uh, you know, you, so you walk into technically a standard format to, to work with, you know, anyone can break it down. You, we had a fairly standard format for the extended mixes you know you'd have a minute and a half or so up until at least up until the chorus but a minute until you're you've you, you've done your build up and you're probably going into an intro chorus yeah whether it was there or not or whether you're creating it and then by a minute and a half you're, you're into verse one yeah and then you can let it run as pretty much as the standard mix unless someone specifically asks for something different after chorus one through to the end of chorus two, and then you're into your middle breakdown. And then there's the big question as Pete uh, Hammond, the other mixer often talks about, part, it, it, we just got into a routine of it where generally, I mean, it could be that one of us asked for it initially, but, but as you, you'll probably notice, there's never a middle eight written, yeah. which Americans didn't like. Right. And it's one of the reasons possibly why a lot of the records weren't as big in America, in America as, yeah. But but there was a general request of well just 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 leave an open section after chorus two, and 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 we're working you know vocal samples and vocal locks, and by the time that we had the the uh, the French Publisson Inferno, which would do twenty seconds at twenty bits yeah. stereo, uh, and and could be played from a MIDI keyboard. You know, it was revolutionary to us at the time. <laughs> you know, seconds, sorry, yeah, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> enough for a, enough for a pop chorus over yeah. eight bars. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so someone else would have, you know, flown in all of the uh, the backer vocals and everything. But then you could just, you know, sample sample a couple of bits uh, and and cut it up and 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 play them. So yeah. so that's why you hear on so many of those records, you come out of chorus two. You know, never gonna give, never gonna give. You know, Rick didn't sing that. I mean, it's it's from, it's from what he the, sung in the chorus, sung. and someone yeah. just played that in. You know, yeah. uh, and so on, and the, and that and that went further and further and further. And and, and Pete Hammond has, has often said, well, you know, yeah, we ought to be getting some something more than just a mix credit for yeah. for things like that. You know, yeah. but anyway, yeah. So you yeah, a middle a middle break come out of that into let's say the bridge and a, and a final chorus, and then extended chorus at the end, you know, breaking down into something the DJ can mix out of. Yeah. So the, the, the vital factors, is there's something at the front for the DJ to mix into and something at the end for the DJ to mix out of. And quite often you'd have something in the middle if the DJ wanted to, but, that, but that's the Waterman thing. I mean, not that he sort of 
said that, but you just learned that as a mix engineer that uh, you know you're being as friendly to the DJs as possible yeah. and making life as easy as possible. Yeah. You know, and to, 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 play your to fit into their rotation. So, yeah. you know, so if you've done something that's that's a bit like uh, a Chicago House record, you, you're making sure that you know they can go over to one of those or or, 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 or the next one. Yeah. So that was that. That was a fairly typical day for me. You know, so generally ten or twelve hour days. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, there was a general thing of tools down, as I said, at ten o'clock at night for the last hour of the pub. Yeah. Sometimes I made it, sometimes I didn't. Uh, and that pub is still there, the Gladstone. Yes, it is. And yeah. quite a few people yeah. sort of go in there and visit. And there's yeah. a very friendly, it's turned into a bit of a music pub, actually, funnily enough. But yeah, all sorts of things got decided in, 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 the, in, in the, the pub, pub, as you might imagine. Yeah. Um, but, the, but upstairs, the start day, uh, especially in the early days when I was, we only had the one studio, you know. Um, there'd be an old-fashioned uh, marker board up of the current projects right and this was part of the problem of what happened with kylie you know in in any single day for the upstairs studios uh with stock and waterman you could have could have gone through bits and pieces on four tracks yeah depending on what pete said in the morning was the priority right so clearly that week that kylie was there she she, she never made it onto the board <laughs> Because <laughs> Pete hadn't, hadn't told the boys. I, I think you said she was basket weaving or something. Oh, no, they took her out. In reception, it's like, what? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I met her in reception when we were having one of our sort of, either hit records or, or birthdays were uh, an excuse, for, <laughs> excuse for, for, for cake and champagne in the reception <laughs> at the end of the day, and I, and I met right. her there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they kept taking her out sightseeing, you know, for four days, and on day five... Wow. The, the manager came in and said, we, "You know, we're not here for sightseeing. <laughs> it's the record." Um, That's but, incredible. But, but you know, I've said this on on other things and on TV. That you know, there's excellent um, Channel Five. Yeah, we are on both sides. I saw that. You know, and uh, yeah, that was really good. And they used my little clip where I confirmed about David Howes, the managing director, was you know never allowed in the studio. Yeah. And no disrespect, he did a fantastic job. But uh, as far as my command were concerned, they were. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't they weren't interested so he broke the unwritten what became the unwritten rule and said guy because pete wasn't there yeah so kylie's manager's screaming probably at david howes <laughs> and he's you know been forced to walk in oh sorry guys sorry i've got to come in but uh <laughs> wow it's incredible um, there's so many different versions of the story but yeah. the, the one yeah. that's certainly been told to me a number of times is that our promoter pit stop who's a great guy he was a you know we People think about, uh, you know, how many aspects can you cover? But we had our own club promoter, you know, working full time on wow. the PWL records, yeah. you know, and that's why they could pull off things like Roadblock and, and, and really get uh, a lot of generated sales just, f just, from, just from clubs. But it was like we were talking about earlier, you know, Pit Stop, you know, blithely says, well, you know, can't you have something that you got on the shelf? Yeah. And someone in the room, again, <laughs> yeah. oh, she should be so lucky. <laughs> And Mike, and Mike Stock's like, it's, well, a, it's a song there. That's an idea. Yeah. And off they went. <laughs> yeah, 40 minutes later, there's the song. Unbelievable. I don't know, but it's Incredible. different versions of that story. And Yeah, uh, yeah there's different interviews. Uh, that's, uh, but it's, uh, it's all kind of based around the same yeah. thing. There's different stories around Rick Astley as well. Some, some, some say he was a T-boy for a year at the yeah. studio. No, he was, he yeah. In front of a microphone. Well, not, maybe not a whole but, year, but best, yeah, best part of yeah. He came in on a YTS scheme. Right. Youth training scheme. Yeah, because Pete, yeah. didn't Pete find him in a club, in a sort of ex working men's club up, up north? Up north. Thought, oh, he's got a great Warrington or, or whatever. He's and, quite cute, um, he'll do. You know, it was quite difficult, I think, at the time of persuading Rick uh, to, 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 you know, to leave the band. And the band had a manager which, which you know, made it difficult for Pete and the others to do the deal. But, uh, but yeah, the only people that knew. He was more than a T-boy. Were, were 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 Mike, Matt, and Pete, because I think Pete had said to Mike and Matt, "Look, you know, he he needs to get used to the atmosphere." Yeah. But I think we could develop him as an artist. Yeah. And uh, but that's how he was introduced to most of us, uh, and we didn't think twice about it. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But eventually, Pete asked myself and Ian, uh, you know, to to do a bit of co-writing with Rick and see what ideas he's got song-wise. So he came down to the to the sub bunker. Which was so I was in the bunker and Ian was below in the sub bunker, and and, and our patch bays were connected, 
but he had a fair light down there trying to do 24 track tape machine he had right. a, everything you could need you know yeah. and a little vocal booth that uh, when it was first built waterman used to sleep in there <laughs> um and, and and one of the other funny things that happened in the vocal booth not, nothing dodgy <laughs> <laughs> or not not i was aware of but when when uh when jason was in uh he'd want to go somewhere to warm up for vocals upstairs and for some reason we got into a routine because we didn't use the vocal booth very much of uh, oh well they, you know there's a soundproof vocal booth in there jason so we'd go in there with a cassette you know on a walkman and scream away into no, like no microphone <laughs> just to get himself warmed up to to go upstairs it was funny. Right. yeah so we came down and um uh it, it, it's there's a couple of songs on my compilation cd that goes with that book yeah which is no longer available have you got the cd i have got the cd yeah, yeah, got the CD. Got, uh, yeah so there's a couple of songs on there from rick are, are, are the songs i'm talking about right demos so we did two things or, or make well Mainly, we did a typical thing of like, you know, he, he's a fairly up-tempo dance pop backing track. You know, can you write a top line onto that, Rick? Yeah. So a couple of them are like that yeah. and, and ended up, you know, Rick, you know, quite rightly saying, well, not really my sort of thing, but good experience. Yeah. And we, and we ended up doing them uh, with a couple of other artists. So we did some of that and then it wasn't really until album two that, 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 that Rick really got going with his own songs mm. you know i'm pretty sure no no sorry on album one there were two or three songs of his right which ian and i produced and day days wash burn did a couple uh but let's let's say there was six or seven stock aching waterman songs and yeah so rick had his own songs yeah which you know right but we hadn't demoed them down when he was uh developing you know they, they went straight into full production um, but then he, he he put his foot down heavily on album two, right? To to get more songs on there, and uh, yeah, I've kind of told that story a few times. Mm. Where where we nearly lost him, yeah, on album two, and uh, but Pete sent us and Rick down to. By that time, you know the studios were so busy. He, he, Pete needed more studio, and Pete Hammond was the co-owner with Manfred Mann of the Workhouse Studios right. in uh, Elephant and Castle. So Pete said, you know, go down there for a few days with Rick, you know, look at a couple of the, his new songs. And he had one written called She Wants to Dance With Me and co-produce it with Rick. That was the other thing, you know, Rick, he wasn't desperate, I don't think, to get into co-producing, but he was desperate to, to do his own song yeah. and, and kind of do his own thing. So we made it as, as, as real as possible for him in as much as we hired a bass player, guitarist, sax player, uh you know different different pair of backing vocalists you know to really try and make it different to to what was happening what in was the main it? building mm -hmm. and it worked out well but uh but i knew when we got back to pwl to mix it um that waterman would immediately say no we gotta have a force kick on there because it, it wasn't a force kick and what's what's that real <laughs> bass on there take that off <laughs> yeah so so the point <laughs> at the point of mixing Ian and I already had a force kick ready to go and a program bass ready to go. Wow. Almost knowing that Pete, it Pete, what Pete was going to say that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that was it. Fantastic. Wow. <laughs> but for Rick, it was it was a way of moving on and, and doing a second album that he was happier with. Yeah. Uh, at least. But that, but then he went after, after that second album. Yeah. It was, you know, it was, it was a shame to lose him. It really was. But again, a common thread going through all of that material, Rick's voice. Oh, I mean, I thought it was Luther Vandross or something yeah. when I first heard yeah. it's incredible. that record on the radio. Unbelievable I voice. I know, and the Americans couldn't believe he wasn't black, you know, when they yeah. saw when they saw yeah. him. Yeah, yeah, sort of cutesy kind of sort yeah. of yeah. kid from up north yeah. with no, that it was coming amazing. out of his mouth. It was amazing. Yeah, incredible. I remember the first time also I went to uh, the New Music Seminar, they called it, in New York in, in, in the mid-80s. Uh, the guy from Tommy Boy started it. Right. And... and Pete didn't like Ian and I going over there, but we, you know, we were so wrapped up in the, the remix and the dance world, and you know, a lot of our mixes would do well in the Billboard dance chart. Yeah. You know, things like Blue Mercedes would be right up there um, in the dance chart. And, and, and I walked in to Sire Records for a meeting with Seymour Stein, um, and he almost refused to let me come in 
because obviously my reputation was was a remixer and all these club records. Right. And so you're not you're not Phil Harding. You're not you're not black. <laughs> you're not... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, strange, but um, yeah, they were they they were fun. Those 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 conferences. Finally, Pete came over for one and realised what it was all about because yeah. it's. You know, a bit like we were talking. We'd go around at ten o'clock at the pub and, and do all sorts of things. But uh, you know, p people were doing good business in the bar each night at the, at the seminar. Right. You know, and we we come away each year with like an offer of another three or four mixes. Right. You know, so yeah. so so it was well worth going over there. But uh, you know, it was PWL. We were managed by PWL, so Pete liked to keep control over everything. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and that he did a damn good, yeah. damn good job yeah. of. Yeah. And till kind of the early 90s when, mm. um, so it starts to, not fall to pieces, well, I guess it just kind of start to fall to pieces, but it's, uh, and we've, we've already spoken, there were lots of things that sort of happened to um, to, to trigger that off. Yeah. Tastes changing. Um, I yeah. believe Matt, Matt Aitken left. Yeah. Um, I think as, Matt as left in 91. 91, yeah. Yeah. And so did Pete Hammond. Left before us. I mean, it was you know it was rats off a, a sinking <laughs> ship. It began yeah. to feel like. Yeah. Uh, and then at the end of '91, I said to Ian, you know, it's 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 hard to be sure, but you know the work work was drying up, uh, and I said I think we we would do better off moving on. Mm. Uh, and and the thing, one of the things that really triggered it, I, there's probably a couple, but the one that really sort of made me think, oh. That's that, that. That's not good for us, really. Was we we were offered to produce the first three take that tracks. Right. The manager wanted us to do it. The label wanted us to do it. Talking about myself and Ian. Yeah. They they didn't want Sock Aching Waterman. As it turns out, they wanted no association or credits for PWL whatsoever. Right. And it became a deal breaker. So there we were with three tracks. Uh, promises was 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 were amongst those three, you know. And in I mean, we weren't as good as sniffing out the hit as Waterman or others in the building. But but that felt like we could yeah we could make a great yeah ballad of that and just becoming aware of you know new kids on the block. Here's take that. Okay, there's a there's a trend here that could suit us more than acid jazz yeah. or acid acid uh, house. Yeah. Um, and uh, we couldn't do the deal, right? Basically, um, because uh, take that's manager, um, can't think of his name. Sorry, refused. You know, on 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 the contract and on the credits to have PWL PWL on there, and David House and Waterman were saying, no, it's you know, it's got to be produced by Phil Harding and Ian Kerno for PWL. That's our standard credit. And, and and we lost the gig. Wow. Um, and Pete Hammond got that gig because he was prepared. Uh, I'm not saying that's why he left specifically, but but he got that gig <laughs> by not being part of PWL. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know the ins and outs of the other people, but that's certainly that's what happened to us. Yeah. And really triggered to myself. Uh, and lo and behold, as soon as we left uh, in early '92, um, and Music Week. You know, we had a little thing on the front of Music Week. You know, Harding and Gurno leave part of PWL, and yeah, uh, yeah, I, and, remember, I remember seeing that. Yeah, yeah, and we moved over to the strong room, and suddenly all these people started phoning up, saying, "Oh, great, we can hire you again now." Yeah, and I think. <laughs> well, why couldn't you hire us? So that people began not to want to be associated, associated with, people, with, it. Yeah. With, with PWL and the sound. Yeah. That's how. You know, I think that was I think that was wrong. I think that was a mistake. But that's just how it had built up inside the industry, mm. and that's how the industry is. You know, it, it, it puts things in pigeonholes, yeah. and and you know, you, you either want to be going to that pigeonhole or you don't. You, don't. you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and that was it. So that starts another hugely successful decade for you and Ian. Yeah, um, in yeah. production. So um, yeah. this so this this book covers. The Pete Waterman years, PWL, yes. Pete Waterman Limited, all the Stock Aitken and Waterman stuff. Um, and yeah. if you haven't read this book, audience, it's absolutely incredible. I've read it, I think, four times <laughs> now. And it's it's big old thick book, and it's not big letters. Yeah. There's a lot of words yeah. in there, and there's a lot of input, as you say, from other from other people as yeah. well. And well, 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 the editor, there's... I've got to give credit to um, uh, to John Palmer, the editor. Basically, basically, I I'd, I'd done a book myself 
half that size. Right. 250 pages. Right. And that's 600 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, put it out myself. And John Palmer came along and said, look, I, I've been involved in a lot of PWL uh, re-releases uh, on Cherry Red. And I think they'd be interested in the book if we if we ramp it up a bit. Because uh, they're also a book publisher. So so we went to Cherry Red and uh, and really John Palmer sort of instigated all this extra information that's mm. in there, you know, talking about specific records, yeah. uh, equipment, and, and and so on, and it and it turned into six hundred pages. But yeah, and it, and it's great. Um, and for for geeky like me, all the all the uh, like <laughs> yeah. you say the bit of, at the end about breaking down a sort of day and the, and the mix sessions. Yes. Um, yeah. And and there's little bits on each individual artist and what they would like to work with, and so it covers yeah. the sort of psychology and. Uh, it's just, just, yeah. just yeah. fantastic. I deliberately so, finished the last chapter on the kind of hoping I'd get a chance to move to on, to move on, and and write about the nineties, which is what we. Which you did <laughs> with with this, well, and I only I I, I, only, <laughs> I only just really saw that this had, that you'd done this um, a couple of months ago, which right, is what spurred okay. me to get in touch with you. Okay. Um, and it, yeah, it. it here we are. <laughs> I bought one. Now this is. Um, as I said earlier, I'm about three quarters of the way through. I haven't quite finished yet. This is absolutely unbelievable. Um, and is that a box of T fives in the strong room? Probably there in the behind yeah, the SSL. Yeah, that's the SSL room. The strong room four. Great, yeah. great speakers. Um, um, yeah. But this is incredible because, uh, well, manufactured pop and boy bands of the 1990s. Yeah. Um, and I. I before you came down, I tried to the bit I hadn't read. I tried to to sort of skim through it and just get a general gist of it. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, and I couldn't. I was like, no, it's, 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 it deserves a proper read at least. Um, it does. And, I mean, and, you can dip in in and out of different sections. Yeah. That's that's part of the thing of it. Yeah. You know, there's a production section, there's a songwriting section, um, and I think the most amongst the most useful is the mixing section. The mixing uh, section is where, incredible. Where I've put it that's, into. Uh, a 12 step uh yeah mixing top down as i call it you know vocals first which i started doing with e17 because we were so vocal heavy yeah with tracks you know and and and, and, and what i figured was well if the most important thing to the band the manager the record company and the public with boy bands it, are the vocals then surely you know I, 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 whereas we used to do them last in a mix you know build it up to the vocals yeah Surely I, you know, crack the vocals first uh, and everything else should fall in place underneath that. Yeah. And that's, and I developed that as a mixing style that, that worked really well. So, you know, it's, fu it's fully described in there, but obviously you need something to, to, to kind of, you know, apart from bringing your master fader up to zero and your, and your vocal group up to zero, let's say, um, and all the, the general kind of, um, you know, EQ and reverbs and delays that, that, that I know I'm going to use, it generally needs some sort of pad keyboard there to, to, to at least route that to. Yeah. So we got into a routine, you know, we, we used to call it uh, Ian's pop pad, and and it would even be mono, right. a really sort of nothing sound yeah. that, it, that, that may not even be there on the final record, but it's there for the purpose of, A, referring things to as you're going along recording, but specifically for me to have there, you know, to, to start my mix. Yeah, there's like a sort of anchor for... Uh, an anchor, because you, you don't want off. something that's dropping in and out. It's got to be constant. Yeah. So it could yeah. be a guitar, um, and it, but it doesn't want to be something that's, that, that's, that's taking up space. That's right. the point. Um, and it's almost like nothing above 2K on it, you know. You like that? Yeah. Um, so that... And, and, I, and I, I'm going to make that... Uh, that's, that it's never been public so far. Right. It was published in another academic book. It, it, it's in that book, um, available from my website, by the way. It is. Should we mention yeah, that? We definitely need to mention Phil that. Music.com, yep. both books. Um, I think that's, for me, anyway, I, I hope, right. the most valuable piece of information that, that, that I've managed to put across in, in, in both books because, and, and I have done it with students, you know, if, if you follow these 12 steps, it may not be the final mix, it may not be the right mix, but it will hopefully focus you on a good pop radio mix. Yeah. Uh, and, if, and certainly if that's, if that's what you're aiming for, that's what you're after. Yeah. Um, 
because I go through, okay, everything on the vocals, you know, I, I talk about, you know, the whole, uh, uh, the whole processing, uh, and, and, and I do the same all the, all the way down to the drums. And you explain it really well. So you're explaining about, uh, you know, the first compressor you might put on a vo vocal chain with a sort of yep. ratio of two to one, three to one tops. Yeah. And But you're explaining why you're doing that. And, yeah. And, and yeah. It, it's and not just like a do this, like you see it on a lot yeah. of YouTube videos. It's like, must do this on every mix. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're saying, you know, this is a good starting point and this is why yeah. you should do this and how it affects everything else. And yeah. it's it's a, it's yeah. really, exactly. really well put together. And it's, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm a big believer and I, I did discover it quite early in my, in my career. I believe this with production, but I certainly believe it very strongly when mixing is you've got to have a picture in your mind of how you want it to end up. You know, so we call that a sonic picture. Yeah. Various other terms in academia. Um, but to me, it's a 3D soundscape, and I'm, I'm making that shape because I'm kind of, there's your stereo soundscape. Uh, but it has depth to it as well. Yeah. And obviously the processing and the reverbs will bring things forward and back. Uh, and, and one of the great examples of this in recent years, I think, are the Ed Sheeran records, mm. certainly the first two albums, mm. where the producer has clearly planned out how involved Ed Sheeran and other people around him are, uh, were involved in that, I don't know. but. You know, Ed Sheeran's been going out as, as, as before making the first two albums as just, as he still does, just guitar and voice. Yeah. That's the focus. That's the focus of his songs and, and how he wants people to hear it. So your start point clearly is in your soundscape. Here's Ed and here's his guitar. Yeah. What can we put behind yeah, that to complement it on, on, a, on a record? Because clearly, well, that hasn't happened so far, but clearly it hasn't happened across the albums someone has said we can't have an album of just acoustic guitar or vocal <laughs> like you like you are live you know we've you know we want to hit a worldwide market yeah um i think it's amazing that he hasn't gone out and actually you know with a full band lineup and so on and tried to to to, to reproduce the albums like because i think what they've done with the soundscape that's what i'm saying yeah you know complementary drums other guitars keyboards all the rest of it backing vocals you know i think are great um, but 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 clearly he's got a great live set where he's you know introduced his his, his pedals and his other technology, and it, and it's a great experience live. Um, but I'd be more satisfied if he could reproduce his album soundscape, you know. Yeah. But that's just that's me as a studio engineer and producer. Yeah. So um, I think before you start a mix, a you've got to have that that picture that, that sonic picture in your mind, and really all the things I described there are. It's, uh, I've described it before as painting by numbers. Yeah. So you've got all these areas, you know, and there is there is a diagram either in there or another book, you know, where you fill the areas in, and uh, you know, good reason that uh, you might have a backing vocal melee in the chorus where you haven't panned fully left and right, but you've got nothing in the middle. You're yeah. leaving the middle for the lead voice, for, the lead. for instance. Yeah. Uh, you know, basic things like that that. You know, it doesn't take a, a lot to learn, but they're good start points, yeah. as you say. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so back in 2014, uh, for the second time, I'd been asked uh, by a James Connected University, would would I like to do a PhD? Um, and I said, well, this was Leeds Beckett. I said, well, will, will you allow me to do it? You know, on a subject that I want to do. Yeah. Which is exactly that. You know, which boy is... bands and many of uh, a manufactured pop of the 1990s, yeah. which is a crazy thing to really to write about as a PhD. But um, uh, it was, I think it was recognised that there's so many academic books out there that, 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 uh, about the Beatles, Rolling Stones, and, you know, lots and lots and lots of... Exactly. Lots of contemporary music that, that people... Who's written about cheesy pop? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's... Where, where, yeah, where do you learn about cheesy pop? You know? Yeah, and I've also <laughs> learned from this about how, you know, this just didn't start in the 90s. It started in the 40s and the 50s. And, yeah. um, uh, and, and there's some great... The, the other, the sort of, the people you interviewed as well for this, yeah. this book, their input yeah. is, is fantastic. Yeah. And there's some... Um, there's some just fantastic moments for me that just really stick out the page. Your mom was yeah. the kind of formula for putting together a five piece 
boy band and like oh, yeah. so you need a gay yeah. one you need a blonde one you need a cute one you need a hunky one yeah and and there's and the, yeah you yeah. can sort of see and it's it's a it's a commercial thing it's a business it's there's a business plan yeah a band might have a a, a finite life it's like okay we'll sign this band for three albums and uh, over five years and then they'll all start to get a bit podgy and uh, and that so that'll be it you yeah, know it, yeah, uh, and yeah. it's it yeah it's yeah. it's really honest and yeah. thank you and very 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 interesting and like yeah. i said i tried to skim through the bit i hadn't read before you came down today and i just thought no yeah. it's just not yeah. it, it deserves more respect than, yeah. <laughs> than that so, um, there's, so, so there's a, yeah as i said earlier there's a lot of reference points in there for for people studying and so on yeah you know and there's not a lot of books you can go to in academia that 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 really talk about straight ahead pop you know they're, they're, no people exactly. love dissecting you know great contemporary records but um and the process that's that, as you're saying the process obviously there's a, there's a lot to do before the mixing you yeah. know so i talk about the songwriting process and it's been so in the media in recent times isn't it where, where you've got to be so careful with songs and everybody's looking at the old saying where that where there's a hit there's a writ you know has that been taken from there yeah you know yeah. so so i do i do brush on that subject but um you know the formula of pop songs has has actually in terms of what we now call um song form that seems to be the you know you know i might call it a musical arrangement mm. but a lot of people in in academia think a musical arrangement is like an orchestral accompaniment exactly. or something like yeah. that it's yeah. easy to get so uh, another couple of academics in America, uh, one of them is called Charlie Harding. No, no, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no relation. Um, but if you haven't come across it, um, anyway, they, the they, they, they coined the phrase pop form, pop form being breaking down a song arrangement. Right. Because if you, if you simply break down some of the Stock Aiken Waterman songs from the 80s, you've got a fairly standard thing of a, an intro that tries to introduce bits of the chorus. Mm. You go into your verse your bridge or your pre-chorus and generally the chorus is just eight bars yeah might be a little, a little link but very rare that chorus one would be more than eight bars uh you know if we scoot forward uh because the, the thing that carried on in the 90s although a lot of sounds changed you know and we moved away from using the lindrum to using the tl909 and yeah. those type of samples um we still had the big intro right you know, I've, I've done presentations where I've played a series of E17 intros and it's all in your face. <laughs> How quickly can we grab the DJ and the audience yeah. to say, you know, this is going to be an exciting record. And it's bam, bam, yeah. and a bit of a chorus. Yeah. You know? And that's completely gone right. over the last 10, 15 years. That's not to say people don't still come along and, and break the rules, you know. Um, but if you look at kind of um, One Direction, Justin Bieber, all those kind of pop records that uh you know in, in, in the mid noughties they haven't got the big intro yeah God, it's just it's just a, a it's brief kind of... introduction that could well be the verse um and that's kind of carried on i mean the latest dual lipper records got quite a bit of string thing relating to the chorus at the front mm. uh the coldplay bts uh duo went back to the sort of 90s and 80s and had the chorus at the front but pe you know, I'm hoping people are going to get back to it because yeah. it's an yeah. exciting way to introduce a pop record yeah. rather yeah, than just saying, here's four bars of what you're going to hear in the verse until the singing starts. Yeah. It's just, ooh, it's yeah. a bit flat. But the other major thing that, that's changed is the length of the chorus right. as I'm talking about. And, and, you know, you can hear from the way I'm talking, people like myself study these type of things. And it's, it doesn't take long to break down the arrangement of a song. Yeah. But we've continually been hearing these 16 or 12 bar choruses over the last decade where sometimes the chorus and i'm talking about chorus one will start with a drop and you've got the chorus vocals which allows you by bar nine to bring in probably what's been programmed through the whole thing and then sometimes you'll have uh you know a standard eight bar chorus and then something different will happen at bar nine and it's still going uh and extra hooks so bar nine onwards is 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 something different and extra hooks right but it's very common you yeah. know you, you break down a lot of records uh over the last 10 years or more and there's there's been that theme and it and that's that's still going on yeah 
so I break down those sort of things in the songwriting and, and I talk about in pop production, moving on to the production, um, the vital thing with a lot of vocalists, certainly as, as, as we were working with in the 90s, but it's still, it's still relevant now. You know, if you're a pop songwriting production team uh, and, you know, I do believe in group collaboration, so to me, that can be two people, but even myself and Ian always, you know, uh, as, as a team, uh, uh, as writers, apart from whatever we did production wise, we could never write lyrics. We yeah. could write a melody top line, but we yeah. we were never singers. We weren't lyricists. Yeah. So that always became at least three. Uh, but what I recommend now is at least four people. Right. Because um, I do believe that if someone else is programming the drums, who's a specialist in programming drums and percussion, that takes a big job off of the main keyboard programmer who, yeah. oh, oh, I don't have to worry about that. You know, I can just I can worry about on, notes on, on and, and sounds and, yeah. And then a top liner, and then as I as I've experienced there, ideally what I what I call a team leader. Right. Pete Waterman, fantastic yeah. example of a team leader. Yeah. In the nineties, we had Tom Watkins. Yeah. He managed us. He was managing E Seventeen. He'd previously managed Bros. He'd previously managed Pet Shop Boys. So fantastic agency within the the, the cultural landscape, as we call it, um, and. What we found with Tom, working three years with Tom with E17, is again, we, unbeknown to us, I mean, again, he's probably even less musical than Waterman was, but he knew what he wanted. Yeah. You know, something, I, 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 and when you've got someone in a team, and, you know, maybe if it's a young production team, that team leader needs to be someone with a bit more experience, but not, not necessarily, you yeah. know, someone can have great ears as, as a young person as well but someone that is able to sort of keep the rest of the team on course and on direction and be able to say that's not working or we need to push this further and that's what would happen with Tom it's we'd get to a certain point programming a, an E17 track and he'd push us another 10 20 30 percent you know right. that intro's not dynamic enough this you know dynamics came into it a lot you know with, with, with Tom um, but he was able to uh, even on some not E17 tracks but uh, another act we worked with called Deuce mm. who were like a two boy two girl act he wrote most of the lyrics and the top lines in, in a very um, almost funny but fundamental and interesting way it was like well uh, if, tell me the melody you've got going across those lines and he'd write it out like hangman <laughs> so, so, you know, not, not not that whole word, but that's where that's where the um, the diction needs to fall. Yeah, and that's whether it's one word or a number of words, and it, and he'd fill in the spaces. Yeah, how's that? Yeah, and again, that that's it. That's in the book and yeah, there's yeah. a diagram, and it's <laughs> it's like that's amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. I would never have thought of it. But funny enough, I've I've used it recently on a project, uh, and it does it does help. It focuses you on on. What it, what, yeah, what it needs. What needs fill it in. I mean, yeah. that sounds very childish almost, but... Yeah, uh, no, what a great, what, what know, a great way to do it. Works. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, the, the, um, the final thing I want to talk about uh, that, that, that's in the book is preparing for vocal sessions. Right. And I, I, I do... Th it depends on the artist you're working with, but let's just say at least it's an inexperienced artist, whether it's, whether it's a, a boy band, a girl band, solo artist, whatever... Um, but maybe early in, in their career. Uh, what we learned from working with many pop bands where you didn't know who could sing or how many could sing or whatever, <laughs> yeah. is we got into a routine uh, uh, with a, a regular, regular session vocalist uh, of preparing what we wanted first. Right. So obviously if you're gonna say to a session vocalist, well definitely in this chorus we're gonna want these three part harmonies doing these parts, or to, to do that, they've got to lay down a guide vocal, a guide lead, you know, yeah. to, 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 to work all the other things too. So that, that became our routine. Get the session vocalists in, get a guide vocal down, whether you play the artist or, 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 or the band, the guide vocal or not. But then you've got vocally what, what you want to record laid out. And although uh, Brian out of E17 would resist that, but he was a great singer, so that yeah. wasn't really a problem with him. But it really helped with the other guys 
who who weren't great singers, you know, let's take Stay Another Day as a for instance, you know, here here are two parts, you know, for Terry and John that we think, yeah, the, these would be great with you guys on. So then you you strip everything out, get them in the vocal booth, this is your chorus part, sing along to that. We've probably recorded four tracks already of each part with the backing vocalists. Uh, then we do two each with, with Terry and John, you know, and they've, they've contributed. Mm. This, 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 this yeah. is the psychological aspect that you're yeah. talking about. The, the yeah. artist needs to leave your studio happy. It, exactly. A, 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 and ideally, you know, going home or going talking to the manager, how's the session gone? Oh, great, great, you know, yeah, well, they've done this, you know. And, they, and for Terry and John, bless their souls, they've taken part. Yeah. You know, and that, and that was the reason for a lot of tension with the dead or alive stuff is that the guys from the band weren't doing anything, and they're yeah. trying to put their input in, and exactly. the, the input's being rejected, and it causes and a it, lot of friction. It got rejected more and more. I mean, it was really only Steve, the drummer, that that, that, that carried on being involved in in programming drums, yeah. and Matt was quite happy to let him do that, but it's frustrating for the other guys. Yeah, um, and that's and that's why you know I've talked about it a lot again uh, that y there was a f basically almost a a fight going on when Waterman arrived on, on, the, on the day of finishing Spin Me Round. Uh, the, the other, the bass player and, and, and the uh, lovely guys. And, and the, the point was that we had taken all of their program demo parts uh, and they were either still being used or they were being, uh, uh, the, the sequence was being used with different sounds yeah. that we had yeah. up. So, th so they had taken part. Yeah. But, but we got to the point where Mike and Matt were definitely we had all the vocals, but the, the, those guys in particular, you know, still want to try this and do the and do, yeah, just want know, to keep you know. Yeah. And the guys are saying, no, it's, you know, yeah, we've got not, enough. Yeah, it's yeah. not the seventies anymore. You, you don't know. spend f a month in the studio just yeah. getting the drum sounds uh, right. And, and Waterman walks in at like seven or eight o'clock at night, and, <laughs> and it's all like <laughs> kicking off. And he yeah. basically just kicked everyone out and, and said, "You're staying there, Phil." Yeah, and we mixed it overnight. Mixed it. Yeah. Um, it's so, surprising actually having heard the demo, the original demo of Spin Around, it's surprising how close it is to the, yes. to the finished record. Right? Yeah, it's, no, it's I mean, like, that's oh, what I'm saying, okay. you know, we yeah. use those, those, those sequence parts especially, you know, yeah. and, you know, they, they, they were good and uh, yeah, definitely worthy um, of being kept. And then yeah. the next decade you're working with artists like E17, so you've learned by then as well how to deal with the psychology of that yeah. situation and getting it's, the, as you're saying, getting the guys involved. Again, the, you know, the, the, these are amongst the things that are really difficult to teach. Yeah. university to teach yeah. students you know how do you how do you deal with the psychology of, of, of an artist yeah. you know even yeah you know and, and I've had other experienced people uh, you know quite amusingly talk about you know Richard James Burgess for instance who I uh, mixed quite a few of his records but he you know used to produce five star and, and people mm -hmm. like that you know talked about um, yeah well maybe maybe you should start the session by having a, a Buddhist meditation you know things like get, get everybody <laughs> Calm down, you know. <laughs> um, the thing is, uh, a lot of producers and engineers do do learn, hopefully, pretty quickly, if you're going to survive in the industry, is you have got to leave your ego outside the room. Yeah. It's all right for the artist to walk in. Yeah, yeah they're, <laughs> they're allowed ego, the ego. You know, yeah. and you want them to walk out with their ego and feeling yeah, good exactly. and telling everybody, exactly. great session today and it's all sounding good. Yeah. But, uh, but, 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 but not... Yeah, not, you got to be able to. You, yeah, you, know? you got to be able to leave yours at home. <laughs> uh, you know, unless and I, and I think, well, there's a lot of artists that are quite simply they, you know, that that they are the producers of their own products, and you know, and they've named themselves as as artists. So time times have changed. You know, yeah. you could easily have said back in the '80s, "Stock Aching Waterman" featuring Rick or featuring Kylie, and it wouldn't, you know, because they were the record. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, no disrespect, but the the others were were coming in and doing the vocals and not involved in anything else. Yeah, um, and that's become a a standard thing now, uh, really, for a lot of the, um, especially you know, the hip hop and, and and the big dance DJs and so on. You know, they are the artists, mm. and the people singing are are featured. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah it's becoming more of a thing. But uh, you know, unless unless that's your credit, unless that's your thing, you know. Um, I go back to the, you know the service industry model, and that's yeah. and that's one of the main things that's the, that, that's come out of the book really is what I call the service model of working as a, a pop songwriting and production team with the makeup I've already said, but ideally having someone guide you, yeah, 
and that person could could be your manager of, yeah. of the team, as yeah, Tom exactly. was for myself and Ian. He didn't take a co-production credit. He was manager, but he was manager of the artist and of us. So mm. he's, you know, he's getting a, a pretty good slice of the cake already. And he had all the boys tied up for their publishing. So, um, so he wasn't unhappy at all. But who, you know, to come in and give that advice and spend that time. Uh, but whoever the team leader is, needs to be someone that's the tout of some of the process. Yeah. You know, not sitting exactly. there through the whole yeah. process. A bit like an executive producer, you could say. Yeah. In some ways, but um, yeah, the fresh pair of ears and the fresh perspective. Yeah, and, and that you know, and sometimes that can even be a good A and R person, mm. you know. And and we didn't experience that a huge amount, but Tracy Bennett at London Records, you know, working with him with E Seventeen, he was capable of doing that. You know, I call these record people, and you don't, you know, I've had a forty plus year career, and I, and I can probably name them on one hand, you yeah. know, and I, and I have. In this interview, <laughs> but Tracy Bennett, it was, uh, you know, we get we used, to, and I'm sure it still happens now. Follow up itis, you know, you've you've had a, a big hit or a good first record, and certainly uh, the label will see the next record coming along as as vital, you know, really, and everybody gets really fussy about it, you know. God, you speak to anyone a PW about respectable, I mean, you know. Uh, you haven't got enough. You haven't got enough toes and fingers to name the amount of mixes that went through, and yeah. to the point where we don't really know the final mix was it Pete Hammond or myself or a combination. It yeah. Just, um, but Tracy Bennett. After we had the initial hit with House of Love, and and you know we'd mixed that, but we'd kind of we turned the record around from a hip hop one ten BPM record to, to, to you know. Which sounded good. I don't think anyone's. I don't think that's ever resurfaced since. Have you, have you heard the original? Uh, yeah, no. no. Uh, but Tom came to us, Tom Watkins, right. and said, "I want it to sound like Frankie Goes to Hollywood." I said, "Well, that's got to, you know, that's got to be one twenty BPM and a complete, uh, uh, yeah. You know, so basically all we kept was maybe um, one one lead synth and all the vocals, um, but we went up, uh, we went up a semitone and worked out the very speed on the multi track. To get all the all the vocals in, right, and we were on a beta version of Cubase Audio, wow. which hadn't even been. Uh, but but Ian was always a, a beta tester, and this the mad American guy that's that, that developed it. You know, so it came. It, as many people will know, it came off of the Atari and, and onto the Apple. Mm. And the reason for that was to, was to integrate audio in into your MIDI. Yeah, it was a revolution to us yeah. in the early nineties. We all take yeah, it for granted yeah, now, but yeah, I mean, yeah, back then, and, it was and, and he said, he said, I've done it. I can come in with a machine, and you have four tracks of audio running with your MIDI. So, wow. so, 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 four tracks at a time. We stacked in all of the E17 House of Love vocals, <laughs> and then re, uh, and then basically reprogrammed the whole thing, a semitone up, and you know, it, it got us around 120. Um, but it, anyway, I was talking about the follow-up, uh, which was deep. And uh, again, same thing. It had already been recorded with uh, Robin Goodfellow uh, uh, and everybody seemed pretty happy with what was there. So it's an entirely different record to House of Love. Actually, there was a record in between called Gold. But anyway, as far as Tracy Bennett was concerned, uh, the first two records were, were House of Love and Deep. Right. The one that came in between was a kind of, um, well, we did that from scratch because Deep was such a different record to House of Love. Um, anyone that knows the two records is quite, you know, it's quite down and groovy and yeah. sexy and all the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Tracy Bennett had a vision he, in his mind from not just Robin Goodfellow's version, but a demo. So uh, we pretty much scrapped the two remixes that he and I had done. And, and I said to Tracy, well, look, we've already used up the budget, you know, once mixing it in strong room, we, and we used to go back to PWL and mix in my old bunker room, um, if we couldn't get into, into the strong room uh, mixing suites. Um, I said, well, look, why, why don't you come into our room, our, our programming room, and just show us what you want. And he was able to, mm. you know, he came in, uh, we got up the original multi-track, we had what we had programmed running live MIDI, uh, you know, and, and the original 24 track, and it was mainly what he what he wanted to hear from the original. 
plus a few of our bits that he liked. But literally within an hour to two hours with some quite strange panning and quite things that weren't <laughs> quite, I wasn't particularly comfortable with, but, but he was absolutely, this, that's it. Yeah. You know, within two hours, we had it. And I said, do you want us to do go over to the main mix room? That, that's it. Sounds great on these yeah. speakers. Sounds great in this room. Done. And, uh, and that was it. And it was, you know, and it was a hit record. Right. And there's not, you know, it's one thing coming across a Waterman or, or a Tom Watkins, but, you know, yeah, to come across a solid A&R person that, that is not only willing to put their neck on the line, but willing to come into the studio as well. Yeah. You know, we often yeah. had Simon Cowell in the studio. Right. <laughs> I won't go on too long <laughs> about this. And, um, you know, there was, there, 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 there was a record we made with a band called Miro. I don't know, we were on, we, we almost hit 10 mixes. Let's say we're on version seven or eight. And Simon's really happy with everything that we got. And, you know, you get to the point where you're, you're sending the mix out you're, and you're discussing and all the rest of it. And, and the last thing you want is Simon Cowell in your studio. No disrespect to him. <laughs> <laughs> because he's not, you know, you know, he's a TV person, I've seen everyone. But you, you've only got to watch him on, on, on one of the shows. And if you're a musical person, you know he's not musical. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Oh, yeah. Um, just uh, no disre disrespect, although that, I've said this before anyway. Um, okay, come down to the studio, Simon, and tell us w what it is. You don't like. You know, yeah. that either you don't like or you still need to make it work. You know, and, and, and in that particular case, it was a tambourine. Right. There existed one tambourine <laughs> part. Uh, he wanted it, that plus another part, which was really because we, we were doing a sort of a, a mock Motown thing, and uh, and he said, yeah, and I want the first two bars or something to, yeah, just just tambourine, tambourine like foot stomps and hand clap, just like an old Motown record. Yeah. Ah, that's what you want. Brilliant. Okay, <laughs> that was it. Done. <laughs> Brilliant. But but you know some classic remarks like, oh, what's what's that ticking over in the left there, Phil? Oh, that's the hi hat, Simon. <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. But you, yeah, but you need that. You, again, part of the team, you need that sometimes. You just need that. Yeah. The ears to come in. The, yeah. the, like Pete Waterman, the person who's been a DJ and who's yeah. been to music for decades and loves the Beatles and Motown. Right. And yeah. You need someone with that. Yeah. That to, to, and to and, and they're, they're rare. You know, yeah. the, I mean, there's been films about A&R people and, and, yeah. uh, and how, especially from the 90s and all the... And all the drugs, you know, and it's you, you became, unfortunately, as a sort of, you know, producer and songwriter and engineer, it's wary of them, mm. you know, uh, very wary of them, yeah. and um, yeah. So, so generally, and, and, and unless it was drastic, you wouldn't, you'd hope to please them without them having to come into the studio because, because yeah. you knew it was going to be tough. Yeah. So, what's the, what's the future? Do you think for any for any any aspiring kids watching this video who, who, are, who are just starting out on their yeah. on their journey. What's what what's the future? Obviously, technology has moved on a well, it, oh. it moves on a huge amount. From I mean, you. the technology to hand is is fantastic, you know, yeah. for all of us. And uh, you know, it was a big thing when when hit, a few hit records came out of you know the bedroom. But it's just now you can do so much with a laptop and a few bits. You know, if you make the right choices. Yeah. Um, I think I think the biggest thing is, is, to me, you know, what I kind of go out and, 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 and preach a little bit and try and plant into people's minds is what what, what is your skill set? Because for me, uh, you know, a lifetime in the industry, if, if I'd have attempted to do everything I've done entirely on my own, I, I don't think I'd still be alive, let alone, yeah. any, you know, I'd have gone crazy. Yeah. So I, I strongly believe in, in group collaboration, no, almost no matter what the genre. Yeah. But but certainly in, in in pop and dance, and we do see that. You know, we do we do see. Uh, but within the idea that okay, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to be part of a, a group collaboration, part of a production or remix team or songwriting team. Um, what is your skill? Mm. You know, what 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 can you add to the team, and what are the things that you don't particularly like doing that you'd rather someone else take care of? So it's kind of, and that's one of the great things about education, especially, you know, if you do a three year undergraduate course in, you know, production or sound engineering or you know, something like that, 
you're going to meet a lot of like-minded people um, that, and data tells us this, that often you'll end up going on and collaborating with, even if there might be a bit of a gap down the line. Mm. Uh, but these are your future, well, in the three years you're there, they're, they're, you're, they're your current collaborators yeah. and could well go on in the future. But within that three year experience, you should be realizing and honing in on, on what you enjoy doing and what your skill sets are. Um, and that can be very well defined in a songwriting situation. If, if you are a singer or a wordsmith, you know, head for the top liner yeah. uh, route yeah. uh, and so on. So, so, so first of all, you've got to discover that skill set and, and you don't discover that skill set by working on your own. Mm. Even if you end up working on your own, I still think you've got to go through a group collaboration to, um, to find that result. Uh, and then try and home in on, on making a success of that. And that really is down to, it doesn't, yes, it needs to be a musical direction, but it doesn't have to be out and out music. I know loads of people that, 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 that have come out of the kind of courses I'm talking about and ended up being, well, well I love composing and I love sound design and, you know, yeah. composing yeah. music for, 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 for TV, for adverts, whatever. Very competitive world. But uh, but I know people that have, that, that, that have built it up, had a team, and you know suddenly it might be one person or two people at the head of the team, but suddenly there's ten of you and four studios running, and, and everybody's busy. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and on the engineering side, there's even something I've discovered recently. Um, there's a there's a big market and world out there just for speech recording. Mm. That's huge. You yeah. know. Uh, and unlike a lot of music studios and setups, for some reason in that world, they seem to be able to charge good studio fees yeah. for recording speech. Yeah. In a cupboard, <laughs> normally. It's, in it. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's accepted by who their clients yeah. are, that, yeah. that, 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 that that is the rate. Yeah. Um, yeah, so making decisions like that really is, you know, I think it, we've never managed to do it in our sort of 15 plus years of existence as James, but that, there probably needs to be some sort of bridging system. People I've talked to on a national level within the government education circles realise this. They're, they're, out of most vocational creative courses, there needs to be a six month bridge from what you've learned and done on the course to you know, actually being in the industry. of a career and yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and even if that's a six month you know, as, as, as James did here, shadowing, work experience, you know, but, you know, ideally some kind of, um, oh, what do we call it? Not, not, not the apprenticeship. But yeah, the intern. Intern scheme, but paid, yeah. Yeah. ideally. Yep. You know, and that needs to be funded. And it does, you know, it's generally accepted that, that interns do have to get paid now. Yeah. But, I, but I'm talking about the creative industries. There, my view is there needs to be this kind of six month bridge to, to, give people time to learn the experience like you know like I did like James has done actually you know to be in there with with paying clients and, yeah. and, and working sessions yeah. and that gets you towards learning the psychology of what's going on yeah. around you yeah. Um, and yeah pe people are working towards that but it's it, it's been difficult as many would say with this government yeah you know we've I've been involved from the point of view at least of uh, studio and production in what's called the national music plan uh the first one came in in 2011 for education i'm talking about um should have been 2020 the update i got heavily involved in in putting across the technology aspect of that right technology music education you know in in, in the first plan in 2011 if you had something like a 60 or 100 page plan for the whole country's music education right right through to uh, 18 year olds at least uh there were six pages on technology six in what? in an annex <laughs> <laughs> um wow. and myself and others have put the argument across you know this this you know yeah so it's, it only it got delayed because of the pandemic like so many things yeah so it came out in 2022 and there is technology and its benefits in, in music education splattered all all over it which is great, and um, I think that uh, what next needs to happen 
is to put some of the ideas in there uh, into practice in, in in hardcore education so partly schools but um, for those that are not aware of it a lot a, a lot of music that goes on around the uk is run by what's called music hubs right you know they they came in in with this plan in 2011 uh, as if you're uk based you'll know there's always been a county music service for yeah. every county um some of it is, is is still like that but but a lot of it especially in the big cities are more commercialized and, mm. and more community based yeah um and what we've seen uh it, it, like in anything it the idea of passing on good practice best practice there's been a couple of counties that have hired music technology specialists okay county-wide but to go into the schools and help the music teachers who are not especially the ones that have been around a long time are struggling with technology you know probably more so than their students mm. um and in that particular county that's built up to a little team it's been so successful right you know the the, the guy that i originally met he's now head of a three or four person team that right. goes all around the county helping the schools the colleges uh and, and the community schemes and that's what we need because yeah. there's no doubt in anybody's mind at least government agree with this that that, that that the younger generation are growing up with technology like like we didn't and and if technology brings people into music um, or just something that, that, that interests them and, and engages them, yeah. then, that, then it's a plus, you know. And, and there's evidence of uh, community music education companies that are the kind, they're kind of commercial, but they're working with local authorities where they're bringing youngsters who, who, who won't leave their room, their bedroom, to go into school. They've got them out with yeah. music. And quite often music production you know in in, in the simplest terms yeah. um and, and 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 the students are engaged again and they're back in school yeah so it, it's, yeah it can make it's, such a huge difference yeah so, it's it, so. it, it, it's a long road i'm going right down to sort of uh you know school education they're right to you know coming out of an undergraduate undergraduate degree but it, it, it is also my belief and many people ask this or well, is it worth me going on and doing a master's after completing an undergraduate? And what we've seen happen in universities, certainly in the UK, since the fee system came in, is university-wide uh, lecturers and, uh, 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 and the whole teaching team basically are told to treat students as clients. Right. Because they're paying. They're paying, Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I've seen as, as someone that goes in as a guest lecturer is, is a, since then a big difference in, in student attitude. Uh, uh, and, um, and for me, having been doing this for 20 plus years, you know, the first place I went into in the late nineties was Lipper, you know, the Paul McCartney uh, funded and started place up in Liverpool, yeah. is that only when you get to the master's level, now have I found, that there's always gonna be an exception, but, but generally those that have decided to go on and do a master's where, where there's a lot more self-discipline and self-teaching and, and, and so on, uh, are really as fully engaged as I would hope a studio assistant or someone working with me to be. Mm. Um, and there's just been this kind of mentality grown, partly because of the way the students are treated, that they're the clients and they can do what they want. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, you know, for an industry professional going in, uh, it makes them seem disengaged yeah you know so uh, I, I don't know how one addresses that mm. it's uh but certainly when people ask me should i do that extra year as as uh, doing a master's and will it mean anything to industry it will yeah it will and that extra year could it's probably a good idea dare i say to go to another studio uh, another university right okay N not stay at the same one that you've done your undergraduate because you'll meet a whole new group of oh, people exactly. and facilities yeah, and all those network of it. opportunities and yeah. But uh, you know, just just on Facebook yesterday, I I saw a, um, a person that's doing really well in the music industry, having uh, a get together with master students from one of the master's courses that we accredit at, right. at Westminster. Uh, a reunion, like ten years later, you know, five or six of them, yeah. and they're all working in industry. Fantastic. You know, you so can't. Your answer. Yeah, that's, you can't put those stats to generally. You know, the undergraduates. I mean, the, traditionally the Toynmeister course at Guildford, which is still going, mm. 
uh, and Lippa, their, their stats of people working in the creative industries that they've that they've studied for yeah. are, are very yeah. good. And as an association, I mean, you go to real world studios and everyone there's been through the Tom Meister. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and same Abbey Road. It, yeah. you, nearly every assistant at Abbey Road has, has come off the Toy Meister course. Yeah. But um, but it's tough for a lot of the uh, the other universities to kind of to kind of match that in it in any way. But you know, you, you keep plugging away, yeah, and, exactly. and yeah. it's, it really it's for the students to grab their own opportunities. Yeah. Well, we'll put the link to the James website in the description as well. Thank you. I think that's really important what you're doing with that. Yeah. And, Thank you. Um, That'd be and great. great that you're spreading your knowledge as well and. Yeah, um, is, is and I never thought I'd get into education. I never thought I'd, I'd end up doing a PhD. You know, I, I, yeah, I, I, I yeah. bypassed the degree and everything. You know, I finished <laughs> finished my education at sixteen, and and then, and then, but it just shows, doesn't it? You can come back into it. The toughest thing was learning the academic language that right. that, that, that that people in universities and the academics expect at that, at that kind of level. Yeah, you know. But I was very well supported, and uh, there's there's been a few producers that have done it. Richard James Burgess has right. done it. Uh, Mike Howlett, you know, we're all doctors of music production. Yeah. <laughs> great, well, congratulations. Uh, you know, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. And what a, what a length of course as well, 30-odd years lead, <laughs> sort of yeah. leading up to the qualification. Yeah, true, um, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the best way to do it, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so one yeah. final question, mm. and um, it's the question we have to ask everyone, of course, in mm. 2023. Uh what should we do about Atmos, Phil? Should mm. we should we build a Dolby Atmos room here, or is it a silly thing that's just going to wow. disappear? <laughs> wow, uh, I've talked about it a little bit uh, just from the experience that I had last year of, of uh, kind of being the executive producer to uh, a Dolby Atmos mix of E17 Stay Another Day. That mm. um, got a very good label that have taken over the uh, the catalogue from London Records, uh, and they wanted to re-promote the record for last Christmas because right. it was a Christmas number one. Yep. Um, and I got Gra Gary Bromham to to engineer the because he's done quite a few of the uh, quite a few Dolby Atmos mixes, and I didn't feel that I would have the knowledge to actually, you know, physically do the mix myself. Um, he did a great job. Uh, he's chair of James, by the way. But yeah. he's, he's, uh, um, how do I feel at the end of it? You know, I, I think. Let's put it this way: Ian was disappointed. Ian Kerner, right? Um, but neither Ian or myself have had a full playback in a Dolby Atmos yeah. room with speakers. You know, I've only, I've only had the headphone playback with the you know the headphones that Apple have out. Um, it's got endless possibilities. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things there's a commercial aspect to it as well as whatever we think technically of, of and creatively, yeah. and that commercial aspect is and it, and then clearly it's got through to the record companies that because apple have promoted it heavily basically saying you know if you've got a dolby atmos version we not only will we help promote it it'll have its own playlisting area and, and all this sort of thing and and spotify and others are quickly catching up on that i'm told this year yeah. um so you've you've immediately got a commercial demand driving it mm. you know which which makes me think hmm well regardless of what we might think about it it's probably not going to go away yeah um because it becomes another marketing tool for for the labels and for the artists uh i mean when showing my age again but in the late 90s early noughties when dvda was uh, invented, shall we say, or, or, or certainly promoted. I mean, do you remember that at all? Yeah, just, you yeah, know, just about, yeah. It, it, it failed, and one of the main reasons it failed is that, uh, by the way, that's, that, you know, that's a DVD that's no pictures, all audio, for anyone yeah. that's not familiar with but it was 5.1, um, is that uh, obviously, yeah, quite clear, most punters, the general public, are not going to go out and put a full 5.1 matching system in, the in their homes. Room. Yeah. The difference mm -hmm. here with Dolby Atmos is that it works on headphones. Yeah, so you don't have to. You know, and, and, and we've had a tremendous demonstration by one of the main developers from Dolby, uh, you know, for the James Network two years ago now, where, you know, where he showed that just over, or, or, or even on normal headphones, you, there's a, you can hear it. You can, you, there's a lot of exciting things to be done, depending on who's mixing and how you 
pan things and where you position them. But um, so that definitely works. Uh, and I imagine most people, let's say, or a high percentage who are into Dolby Atmos and listening to it are listening on headphones and it makes it accessible for the, for the general public. Yeah. So that's the difference between 20 years ago and now. Yeah. Um, but then you've got the whole debate of, uh, you know, and I have taken part with some discussions with, with people that are doing a lot of Dolby Atmos mixes. What do you do? Yeah. Where do you place things? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and I've asked a couple of people that and, uh, you know, you, it's one thing having a technical standard. It's another thing having a, a panning and creative standard. And it's at the moment, it seems to me, uh, a lot of people are saying a bit like the Wild West, a bit like if you if you listen to the early mono Beatles records, the uh, the early hits, and like everything's there coming at you, yeah, uh, it's it's, like, and then you listen to their early stereo, yeah, on the drums are over there, and we're having those backing vocals over there, and the records sound really weak, yeah. I mean, okay, they're still classic records. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but directly compared to the mono, and it's a bit like that to me uh, mm. at the moment. Mm. So the Stay Another Day Dolby Atmos mix, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. Gary's done a great job. Um, you're, you're immersed in the back of vocals, which is great because the whole back of vocals are on there really good. And the orchestra is more immersive. Although, I mean, it's programmed, but... Yeah. Uh, you know, it feels like it's out there rather than there. Yeah. Um, but in many ways, compared to the uh, stereo mix, it lacks uh, it lacks a kind of a glue, yeah, shall we and say. Yeah, a sort of power almost. Uh, yeah. Kind of a, a sort of nucleus to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe it's a generational thing. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I've heard immersive audio a lot of demonstrations you know going around to academic conferences and i think when something is both composed prepared and and created for an immersive experience that's quite a different thing to taking a stereo record that sounds great on the radio and turning it into dolby atmos yeah. so that's that's you know that's no I'm being, I'm being positive and negative. Yeah, well, I think there is you positive know. and negative to it. I mean, obviously, yeah. clearly, it's driven by a lot of it's driven by Apple and the need to sell hardware, yeah. which is fine. Yeah. They're a commercial company. That's yeah. what they do. Push Atmos on your music streaming page. Yeah, exactly. It makes sense. I don't believe in all the conspiracy nonsense and all that yeah. about oh, they're trying to get bedroom producers to they're trying to you know, get yeah. them out of the market. I think that's rubbish. Yeah. Um, it's they've got a commercial product and they're trying to sell it. So yeah. that, that's yeah. perfectly understandable. Yeah. Um, for me, there's there's benefits to it other than the surround format, and one of them is dynamic range. Yeah, it affords you enormous dynamic range, yeah. and the loudness wars are truly over if if yeah. they're sticking to the sort of minus eighteen LUFS yeah. level. It, it, and and the other thing is that it to, to, we experimented in, with it, didn't we? And we we I was hoping to have an Atmos set up here for you today, so you could hear stay another day with the speakers round. Mm. But we're we're going to build a dedicated room at the front right. um, now. You're going to do it? Yeah. Uh, we're going to do it. Okay. Um, and go. the reason I'm going to do it is because I have never been able to make as many people cry when I've played in their mixes as when we had that Atmos system in this room. All right. It was roughly 80% of people. Uh, one person had to stop halfway through the track and say, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to go out and come back again. What, really minutes. emotional. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And we were like, okay, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just like having what, a big What were you playing them out of interest? Or you it, it, was their, it was their, their material. Oh, was it? oh um, okay. Oh, wow. Um, and, and Ed's song, he listened to it like, a couple of hundred times, wow. maybe. We, I just left yeah. him in here for the rest of the day and said, knock yourself out, and then sort yeah. of came back in a few hours later, and he was still, just one yeah. more time. Yeah. Um, and have you found it mixing and programming it yourself? Much, much, much easier than stereo. Ah. Because the first, the first decision is... Um, one of the first decisions in stereo is what do I need to EQ out to get this to fit into two speakers? Yeah. With Atmos, it's where can I put this? Yeah. So the acoustic guitar sounds great. And what, what I was actually doing was I was asking a lot of people that I was doing mixes for was saying, can you send me the stems? But can you actually, can you just solo every track? So yeah. solo the acoustic guitar so, and make it sound as good as possible on its own, yeah. which obviously you never normally do because yeah. then you end yeah. up with everything competing for the same space and then send me the stems and then they were sending me the stems and i was just moving stuff right 
and then the acoustic guitar sounded incredible over there and the vocal sounded incredible and the vocal having its own speaker yeah as well um uh, but then the Not, problem is okay well how does that translate to earbuds yeah and initially it sounded like you know two years ago it sounded like the stereo mix but in a bin yeah um but yeah. now it's 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 it's, in, it's improved massively right, right. um and because it's it's decoded on your phone in real time it's not yeah. so when you upload the adm file that's not a st like a stereo mix is a static mix that'll always yeah. be that mix mm. with atmos it isn't it's as the algorithm improves then the the, the yeah. translation improves right. Sounds um, like you've embraced it mark yes, that's good. i love it yeah. i think yeah. it's it's yeah. really exciting it's really energized me again about so so one of the big things for me you know whether whether it's pop or whether it's a, a rock track or whether it and i've had other answers that, that have been fairly predictable is a bit like i was talking with the beatles thing you know where do you put your your drums your basic drum do you yeah. stick with a front stereo and kick in the middle and snare in the middle, or do you? Depends on the genre, depends on the song. Yeah. Um, and it, but it, so you need to respect the song. That's really yeah. what you need to do. Yeah. A lot of people are respecting the stereo mix. I wasn't doing that so much. I was like, well, the stereo mix is the stereo mix, and yeah. that's there. So if you want to respect that, go and listen to the stereo mix. Yeah. Um, I've some of the most enjoyable stuff for me has been Steve Jenowick, who works for Universal and um, Capital in in LA, who's been doing a lot of the. Sort of Miles Davis kind of blue, a lot of the right. the traditional jazz bringing, stuff bringing those up, reissues. Yeah. And what he did was he reamped the live room, so where they recorded the original album, right. it was recorded on three track tape. So they got the best PMCs they had in the studio, put each right. of the three tracks through a stack of PMCs, and then mic'd the live room. Wow. And then when you sit and listen to the Atmos mix, you got you haven't got Miles Davis doing that around the top of your head. Miles right. Davis is there. Right. The drums are there. Okay. The bass is there. But you can hear when he goes up the neck. You can hear the height of the right. And it's and it's like, oh. and then behind you is just the live room, just room, the capital yeah. ambience. Yeah. And you can walk around. And a lot of people aren't using the centre speaker because they say it sounds because it sounds a bit weird compared to the phantom centre you get with stereo. But where people are using the centre speaker, as Steve is, you can literally walk around the room and walk walk over to the drummer and have a listen. And you can, uh, yeah. it's just incredible. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. So so you so that's very much band at the front. Yeah. Um, I did a remix of um, Slave to the Rhythm. Um, which was very much, and that's great for Atmos because it's there's a band, there's a singer, there's an orchestra, there's a horn section, they're all there, and then there's a load of overdubs of synths and effects and stuff like that, and they're yeah. kind of they they're sort of flying around, around a bit yeah. and yeah. putting some guitars behind us and some of the more textural okay. stuff. Um, Sounds like you're pretty comfortable with it. Where you know, uh, yeah, and I, you, I, I can mix do an Atmos mix in about a quarter of the time it takes to do a stereo oh, wow. mix. And on quick the, decisions, uh, yeah. Yeah, and on the on mm. the the project we did for Ed, um, I he sent me the stems all soloed, all sounding mm. really good in isolation. Um, and when he came in and I played in the final mix and he signed it off, we zoomed out of the project and there were two plugins on the entire mix. Wow. There was a compressor on the vocal, there was an EQ on the vocal, wow. and that was it. Mm. There was no, there's nothing on the stereo bus because there isn't one. Um, so, I mean, everything you're saying is pointing towards, you know, uh, younger people coming into the industry mm. and, and students re really do need that yeah. experience in Dolby Atmos because yeah. uh, if it's going to take off as many are predicting, you know, um, You've got to be there, haven't you? Yeah, the technology is improving. That. Sony have already done demos at, at NAM this year of, of a headphone system where at the moment they need to put microphones in your ears to measure the response of your ears. Oh. But they've always they've already got a hundred percent success rate of people coming in and listening to an Atmos <laughs> demo on speakers and then putting their headphones on once they've had their ears calibrated. Right. And the put the people sitting there and going, Yeah, come on then when you're gonna play it through the headphones and then taking the headphones off and going, Oh shit, you are. Right. right. Uh, it, right. It's getting there. Wow. So, um, yeah, I th and you can take a photo with your phone, can't you? With your AirPods, you can take a photo of your ear, and it it right. changes the algorithm to suit the shape suit of you. Ear, yeah, and yeah. that's only going to get better. Yeah. Um, You've answered well, your own question, I really. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, we'll, I, th we'll I, I, I think there's some people of my generation and older, dare we say, that are still sceptical about it. You mm. know, and a bit uh, and a bit jaded by it, um, almost. Yeah. You know, I know, I know when the DVD air ex experiments came along, and uh, you know, we had some demonstrations at the strong room, and 
the, we were loaned to software and so on, and, and I was working on an erasure track. Right. And, and spinning things, I, I thought it was great. <laughs> Spinning sims around the room, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but does that work for a long-term yeah. playback? Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. fun the first time you hear it. Yeah. But most people seem to be saying you, you you need to be avoiding that, really. You need to be tasteful with it. One of the best mixes and one of Dolby's demo tracks is uh, Elton John's Rocket Man, which right. Greg Penny mixed, which, again, is perfect for Atmos. You've yep. got guitars that are supposed to be sprockets going into space, so mm. you make those fly over your head. Mm. Um, and, okay, and what yeah. he did with that mix was very clever in that it starts off exactly the same as the stereo mix. So Elton John's there, the piano's there, and then it's not until the you start to get a bit bored thinking, well, this sounds like, yeah. Yeah, what's this all about? Yeah. And then the backing vocals come in and it makes all the hairs on the back of your head yeah. stand up yeah. because they're just all yeah. around you. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, and I love it for that, the kind of separation it affords you. And, yeah. Um, and it's starting to, to fold down into the sort of stereo version on its own yeah. now as well, yeah. a bit better. So. And their, their backing vocal system was great. You know, the way the band would would do it, mm. you know, work, work, working with Elton, because he, he would leave it to them from, from what I could work out. Right. You know, the, the other band members, I think Nigel Olsen was, the, was at the top. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I've had, I, I had a friend working at... Um, Universal in America at one point, and very kindly, because back, no, this was quite some time ago, so I'm going back to the DVDA times when a lot of things were being uh, digitized, ready for 5.1 mixes. Uh, and they did that with uh, Captain Fantastic and the Dirt Brown Cowboy. Right. So he passed on the, the digital files to me, and it was great. You know, I mean, I was only there for the mix at the marquee, but. Um, it was a great demonstration of how do you squeeze so much in uh, into 24 tracks or yeah. probably 23 yeah you know with with committing submixes of yeah. guitars and, and backing vocals and so on and uh yeah but there was um yeah the, I mean, the whole thing of elton is is well known obviously but the there was a um d uh I don't know if it's on the da -da 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 um bit the big hit off of the album. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, sad, well, not well, sad well, song, but yeah. Oh, someone saved uh, my life tonight. Yes, um, and I don't know if it was that track or or maybe the opening track where, where there's a, a low piano part that's that's obviously been overdubbed, and they've obviously just dropped the parts in. And, and and then when that drops out, you've got what was on there before. Right. And what and what was on there before is uh, uh, Elton on, on an electric piano with like a Shaw fifty eight or something, <laughs> and he's telling the band because because the songs are written on on the fly. Yeah. You know this was uh, wherever they were, um, you know, one one bar to the chorus, and he's doing a guy voice and and he's giving them instructions as they Fantastic. go along. Fantastic. Because because wow. I mean you know. <laughs> Story goes that um, you know they'd be in the studio and and uh, Bernie would fax the lyrics and <laughs> Elton would sit down and write it Turn while everyone off. else was having breakfast and then the band would come in and learn it like that. Wow! And there was the evidence, you know, there's yeah, yeah laying yeah. the backing track down and he's and he's they don't know the song. Yeah, he's so he said he's, he's directing them there and then. Fantastic! That's amazing. You definitely need to check this out, and you definitely need to check this out. Both of these are fantastic <laughs> books. Fantastic work. It's been, like I say, you're, you're a hero of mine. It was seeing your name on the back of that record when I was 13. <laughs> just, I didn't know that job existed. Yeah. And I, I just yeah. clearly remember going, I want to do that. Brilliant. I want to do that. And <laughs> somehow I ended up doing it. Not to the level of you. Wow. But thank you so much for taking time. It's been to a pleasure, Mark. It's been a pleasure. It's been lovely to talk Thanks to you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much.